All right. Um, participation is uh, public has three minutes to speak on any type of event here that we have on the agenda. Having said that, anyone have any comments they'd like the board to address at <coughs> the start of the meeting on agenda items? Okay, seeing none, superintendent's report. I'd like to start off with our winter activities report. Our, our winter sports are coming to a close, believe it or not. Uh, we do have some good news. The high school girls and our boys basketball teams have qualified for the county championship. Uh, the girls also won their division this year, and they've also qualified for District 3 tournament competition. Uh, the boys are in action this week, and the girls will be in action as well tomorrow night, I believe, at 6.30 at the Sovereign Center. Correct? Seeing the audience nodding their head. Um, the boys are in action tonight, right? Right, I, I think as right now. So um, we don't have a score on that. I tried to call Mrs. Um, I tried to call Goose and, and get her feedback, but we don't know yet. If we get a result, we'll let you know. Uh, the wrestling team also starts their postseason competition as well. And for those of you not familiar with the sport, any individual who will happen to place at third or higher. Uh, in their weight class, we'll move on toward the tournament for the eventual possibility of, of winning a, the ultimate would be a gold medal at the state championship. So we'll be wishing them well as, as uh, well. All of our other winter sports have pretty much already concluded competition, including those at our middle school level. Believe it or not, <clears throat> as we sit here, the spring sports season is just around the corner as practices for our spring sports start March 5th. So, um, good luck to the boys and girls basketball team. Um, I'm yeah. actually going to try to get out to the game tomorrow night after I'm, I'm done with a few things, and we'll see how they do. Um, so, we're looking forward to that, and we encourage everyone to, who can get there to come on out and, and see the girls. They've had a great season. Boys as well, we'll see what they do. Item B, we're going to flip-flop item B with item C. Uh, item C is a program that uh, Mrs. Trainer kind of oversees in our district to help uh, fam needy families with um, dental work. It's called the Smiles Dental Program, and she asked for an opportunity to share some numbers and results of how that program has worked out this year. Mrs. Trainer. Okay, thank you. Um, as you know, we're always trying to um, reach out to community family members that have some issues um, either with uh, families of economically disadvantaged students, families who don't have insurance for their children, um, those who just can't get services for their children. And so one of the nurses had been talking at the beginning of the year at a county nurse, school nurses meeting uh, to some school districts that had uh, used a dental program called the SMILES program in previous years and was very happy with it. Um, and so we decided we would pilot it this past, in this current school year, uh, at Birdsboro Elementary Center. And so this particular <coughs> dental group will come on site if you have 12 or more applications completed by parents. And so we have our regular community dentists come in each January and early February, as they've always done. And if the child needs further follow-up, they have in the past... Um, made notations of that, and the nurses then pass that on to parents. So this particular group of dentists um, comes in, they fill out all the paperwork, there's some applications that go home to parents, and so um, <coughs> one stipulation I had was that the children would not be pulled out of a core content class to be seen, um, that she could schedule them around, I'm not minimizing encore classes, but at least it would be um, minimizing the disruption to the core program. And so Mrs. Hughes was able to do that. And so to just give you an idea of how many students we were able to see, um, <laughs> there were um, 10 students that were able to get a dental cleaning um, through the program. There were 10 that were received a fluoride treatment. There were eight that were um, given x-rays. There were three that had a sealant um, process done. And there were three that had abscess teeth that the dentist also took care of. Um, at no cost to the district, and all of it was covered by uh, a form of insurance that this particular group helped the parents to be able to either complete the applications or apply for the ability to use it. So we're looking next year to expand that into other buildings. Um, 
the services, um, it will be dependent on that minimum number of 12 to 15 students that have signed up and have their paperwork completed. Um, but since it was a successful program and um, the feedback from other districts was overwhelmingly successful also, I just wanted to let you know we are doing it in case you ever hear the, about the program. Um, so we were really happy with the results for the first year. So it's just another way that we're trying to reach out to some of our families, especially in communities where they, they don't have access to a dentist, um, just for the health of the children. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. The brochure pretty much tells you uh, the services that they offer. It's a good thing. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Any questions from board members on that? Okay, seeing none. I just again would like to thank Mrs. Trainer for uh, how she helps draw connections and, and gets partnerships with our community to help our students. Uh, thank you, Amory. I think it's it's very very helpful uh, to kids, and obviously dental health is very important no matter where you are. Um, our third item under the superintendent's report is actually going to be a presentation. I'd like to introduce Bob if you want to come up front and center here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen on the board and for the public, this is Mr. Bob New. He's a uh, works for the Mid-Atlantic <coughs> Consortium of Educational Foundations, if I got that right. right. And he's here to talk to us tonight about um, educational foundations and the role that they can play in helping uh, school districts to um, maybe close some gaps and help support some programs that might have to otherwise go away based on, obviously, as you know, uh, many of the budget difficulties that we've been facing. Mr. New's extensive experience um, was the reason I invited him here to come to speak to the public. So I'm glad all of you are here tonight. We have seem to have an extra crowd tonight. So I hope you listen very closely. Um, a few board members have actually already spoken to Mr. New. So this is his second visit back to us, but his first time here with the full board. So at this point, Bob, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'll remove that piece of paper and you can go ahead and begin. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, just so you know, I don't live too far away. Actually, I live as close off of 724, actually becomes 23, so, so I don't get lost going home. Once I get on 724, I just go straight, and I eventually will get to my house. So it's not much of a problem and interesting to come back up here. Let me talk a little bit about education foundations. A couple of things. I was born and raised in Phoenixville, lived there all my life. This is my retirement job. I physically retired from the business world seven years ago needed to find something that I wanted to do that I thought I could help. For some reason, I got into the world of education foundations. The presentation you see on the screen is probably for about a, an hour. We're going to cut that down pretty much down to about hopefully 20 minutes. And then I, if you have questions, please ask. So we're going to move forward and, and see where we're going from there. You know, this was a joke or a cartoon that was given to me probably about four years ago, when it was sort of a ha-ha. Today it's a very serious problem. Daniel Boone, as well as the other 499 school districts here in the state of Pennsylvania, are facing you know, what I think is physical and financial chaos, not only in Pennsylvania, but every state throughout the United States. Education foundations were born out in California in the mid-1980s under a thing called Prop 13. Exactly what happened and what is happening in Pennsylvania happened in California uh, about 30 years ago. They too have about 100, excuse me, about 500 education foundations throughout uh, the state of California. I've been very close to them. I've been to California. I've done their conferences and got to know them. They're a much more mature type of situation. When I talk about education foundations, I want you to understand. We're not a parent organization, we're not a booster club, we're business. And foundations have to be treated as a business because our job is to raise money, period. Second job, like any other nonprofit, is to be an advocate for the children. What we're going to try to do, going the wrong way, uh, we talked about this all the time, and people come up, and I spend, you know, quite a bit of time, and we, we did some questions, I said, you know, Public education is in crisis, and people respond to me with this. What are you talking about, Bob? 
And I, you know, the more I want you, if I say anything tonight, to remember, read the papers, see what's going on out there uh, in the world of uh, trying to fund uh, programs and things that are happy. Superintendents, whether it's uh, Dr. Otto or any other superintendent we have in the state of Pennsylvania, are cutting programs. And what, how, how do they get back in? They're important to the children. One of the ways we feel is our foundation work and how we can get that developed is to make sure that these students are going to have a continuing great education because not and not blame the financial situations on there. This diagram was put together by a person by the name of Jay Himes. Jay is a good friend. He's the executive director of PASBA, which is the Pennsylvania school business of, of, of programs. Talking to Jay, and I talked to him quite a bit, he told me back in the summer that our funding, meaning all the Pennsylvania school districts, will not get back to its levels of last year for the next 10 years. That's him saying it, not me. These are the programs that they did a survey across the state that uh, what are going to be cut. These are the ones that you know, you're seeing that, you know, once they were there very strong, now many of them are going to, you know, they're going to eliminate uh, full-time uh, kindergarten, summer schools, tutoring. These are the programs that across the state are being cut by various school districts as you're moving forward. I keep going the wrong way. I keep talking about, you know, the, the crisis you're facing in public education. We're talking about revenue enhancement. We're talking about programs being cut. This is what the whole goal of our foundations are about, is the how to help that and help the school districts as they go forward. Uh, what I talk about and when I talk to most people, what the role and the mission of the foundation is, is to support and provide programs the school district can no longer fund. And there are a lot of those. And we'll go through them when you hear them. And I'll, you'll talk about some of the ones that, that are doing very well. Talked a little bit about the California situation. Now it's affecting all our school districts here in the state of Pennsylvania. Important just to give you a background in Pennsylvania. Actually, there's about 215 what I call local education foundations that I can identify. So every once in a while I'll get one that... Uh, that I don't hear about. But we basically have served, and I've been to either into that foundation, know that foundation, spoke to the principals, to probably over 185 of them. So I have a pretty good feel of where they are. I've been in board meetings, I've been in workshops like this, and I see this pretty, I have a pretty good idea about what's happening in each one of our foundations more than anything else. Uh, what I really learned, you know, if you take those 200 foundations and we get away, they're, they're good, bad, and indifferent. The, the hard number of it, when I calculate it, I'm probably tougher than anybody in the world. There's 200 foundations. I consider about eight of them any good. There's, about, there's a few others that, that do okay. I'm not saying every one of them is bad, but more than half of them really don't do too much of, of anything. How we grade them. We grade them pretty much on a, a lot of metrics, a lot of number data, which is where I came out of the business world. It's something I always understand. But this is a great way to how we look at when I come in and say, okay, Mr. Foundation, what do you do? How much money do you raise? And they'll give me some funny number. But we basically have a, a, a benchmark. That benchmark basically says this, and I didn't say it came out of a book written by somebody else. I always get blamed for it, though. It says a foundation should be able to raise 20 to $40 per student per year. So you're almost at 4,000 students. You know, so your range, when you start up, should be 80,000, go up to about 150,000. That doesn't count an endowment that we encourage everybody to build. So that's what we think a foundation should be able to do. We look at it subjectively. Here's 10 things that you should be doing. Probably the one biggest thing that we look at all the time is the Pennsylvania tax credit program. I spend starting last month, you know, for the next six months until July 
1st, when that budget comes due here in the state of Pennsylvania, we are very fortunate and blessed about having a program called the EITC, or Pennsylvania Tax Credit Program. Last year, our foundations raised or received about $3.5 million. The sad part of it is only half of them are approved. Out of the 200 foundations, we have 100 that are approved. And they go from, we have a foundation that receives about $300,000 from that program to $1,000. But it's a program that's there. We're the only one in the country. We should be very proud of it. And I, I get calls every day. How can they have one of these? I said, go talk to your governor. I've been to New Jersey for this year three times trying to get to, I'm about one step away from Christie. He says he wants one, but I'm not quite sure he really does, talking to some of the senators who are supporting him. But it's a great program. This is the, stuff, the type of things that we do. We have foundations to raise $40 per student per year. We'll go through some of those, and you'll hear a little bit about them. We talk about you know, how you do it. It's about making the ask. And we, we encourage people to go out from our foundation board and start to see all the areas that we can look at. We've calculated probably over, very specifically over the last three or four years what's the common ground for a successful foundation. About four or three years ago, we had a conference in Gettysburg College and we invited certain people to come and prior to that we asked them to do a questionnaire. Questionnaire, and the only, it was about 50 questions. I asked one. I said, basically, where's your pain? It came back and our people you know, sat down, analyzed them, wrote them all out. And all our foundations, 95% of them, their problem was their own foundation board. Non-functional. So that's the biggest area that I have to worry about and what we look at. But we found some other things. Why are successful foundations successful? I don't want to talk to you guys. <laughs> Superintendent and school board has to be the visionary people that drive the force. The next one's an ex executive director. You have to have a dedicated, paid executive director. Those who have them do great. Those who don't have them don't do anything. Very easy, very complicated. We have some great ones. They happen to all be mostly in this area. In Phoenixville and Norristown, uh, today we started one at Great Valley, who I think is going to be a, a, a very strong one. Uh, these are the type of people that, you know, they, they get the job done more than anything else. What's that executive do? She basically has to have a skill set of an out of the nonprofit world, have been able to raise money, self starter, personable, a great communicator. These are the things that, that we look at. And when we say, if you really want a great foundation, first person after the superintendent of the board says, let's go do it, let's make it happen, you got to find the executive director. And without then, I, w I basically will tell you, don't go. Don't move any forward. If you don't have that one, you might as well just waste your time. And I don't want to see people, you know, wasting time. They do a lot of things, but basically they're there to raise money in you know, various types of ways that we can do. She, they're out there meeting with our school people. They're meeting with the community people. They're doing a lot of other things, but they're the... This is the engine. This is the engine that's going to drive you. And if you really seriously want some down the road, you're going to have to say, I'll be the first one to tell you, you have to have an executive director that is, that is both qualified and can do the job. And they're out there. Uh, we go through a lot of searches. We know what to look for. We're looking for specific people. What did you do, do? I'll give you some examples. You know, they're, they're very involved in the PA tax credit program. They do a lot of our special events, the giving campaigns that we try to go out and look at uh, more than anything else. There's one of the, I'll give you some interesting stories. In Phoenixville, which is my hometown, Alba Mater and everything else, our executive director went after is Jim Gerlach, your state rep for congressman. Mm -hmm. 
She went after Jim Gerlach for $150,000. Took her nine months, but she got the $150,000 for some grant. I don't know what, what grant she is. She's now at Norristown, and in the, since September, uh, she's kind of good. She's raised $4.5 million. She's got a grant for $1.5 million. They know, she knows what to do, how to do it. Another example was right up the road at Pottstown, Terry Lampy. Uh, was their executive director for, now she's up at Why I'm Missing, but she raised $2.6 million in two years. So there are people out there that, that really can do those type of jobs. Now we look at, you know, what I call the, you know, the relationships, the, the linkage, uh, the alignment, and it's so important between the foundation and the school district. They have to work together. I make no qualms about it. Uh, a lot, I, I, and I upset a lot of foundations, very trust me. I said there's only one group of people that understand the issues of the school district and what needs it for the children. It's, they're called the superintendent and school board. Foundations like to go off on their own and believe that they have all the great solutions of the world. <coughs> and when I see that, I see failure. And I tell them that right off. The most important people here is, and I'll tell you how we align that. We basically say for those who are functional, those that are doing good, here's the deal. They sit down with the superintendent of the school board and they say, where's your pain? What do you need? We did this, I'll give you a, a very pure example of what happened in Norristown. This happened back in August, because I sat in on the meeting. President of the Foundation, Superintendent. What do you need? She said, we give laptops to every student 9 through 12. They're five years old. A million bucks. Foundation said, we're not taking that job. I said, good, because now I'll get it, and she just did. So they got that. They needed 25 computers for a very specific type of program in their graphic arts and their TV studio. Total cost was about $35,000. Foundation has already found the money for that. They are, that's what they are receiving. <clears throat> the goal of the Norristown School District is to have a smart board in every classroom. They have about two-thirds of them already filled. Foundation said, good, every time we get an extra $4,500, we put a smart board in. Under what I talked to you a little bit about was the Pennsylvania Tax Credit Program. They're going to develop a robotics club and a robotics team through monies they generate within that tax credit program. That's how it's done. So that's a bit, little bit about... Uh, I'll, I'll figure this out. They're separate, but they're together. There has to be alignment between the two. Everybody talks about the legal issues. There are no legal issues. Uh, they have a common goal. The common goal is to help the people in this school district, especially the boys and girls and the students for you know from now as long as they possibly can. I don't think people realize the crisis that we're really in and what's getting cut. You listen a little bit of the financial committee. There are things going to be cut. The governor just cut the budget again. The money is not there. It's not so much as the revenue generation that's not there at local level, state level, and federal level. Those revenues that were once there are no longer there, so things have to get cut. Who's going to fill those gaps? If you had a good program and all of a sudden it disappears, that hurts the students. So you need to find somebody that can go out and, uh, and, and look at it and get that stuff done. You need a whole, if you go back into the history of education, go back into the history of education. It was the, back in the 1800s when it was all talked about it takes the community to raise the child. We may be circling 360 and going back that way. It takes this community working together to make sure that the boys and girls that live in this area will have a great education. We believe very strongly what I've seen in California, where I see in our good ones, an education foundation, you know, can make the, the best place to go. From a school board, superintendent, they have to, what you're doing is knowing what showing what the budget is. 
we have a, on our board, or the Mesa board, we have some pretty talented people. One of them is uh, just retired as a superintendent. She's a secretary of Mesa. Her name is Connie Kimmer. She works a lot closer with me. And she retired in June of the, of the superintendent in Camp Hill. She would go and talk to the people, especially her foundation. This is what's happening within our budget. These are where you can help. These are the things we want to do. They were the type of people that we want to make sure that everybody knows what's going on and how we can help the children. It's a one for all. My goal is basically this, that eventually we will come to what I call the one model, college model. People don't realize this, other than I won't talk about, you know, at Penn State. There is, Penn State has one foundation, one. <coughs> University of Pittsburgh, where I'm at, one foundation, everything. And you know what? The information's public. So if I want to find out how much our president makes, I just go, I just go up on GuideStar, pull up the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Norberg makes $1 million a year. But if I went to the University of Iowa, their foundation, my best friend, is the highest paid employee. He's the football coach. His name's Kurt Ferns. He makes $3 million a year. But I see all that information. And everybody else does. It's, it's public information. But there's only one foundation at the University of Iowa, at the University of Pittsburgh, at Penn State University. And that's what we're trying to get, where we bring everybody under what I call the one umbrella. For the simple reason, the 501c3 means when you give it a donation, it's tax deductible. It's just fun the county that handles all the other things. So we have sports programs, music programs, anything else, build the endowment. Probably the most important thing that we look at right now when we try to encourage our foundations is endowment building. We had a superintendent in Phoenixville by the name of Dave Noyce. Dave retired a couple years ago, but five years ago he came out and he said, I would like to see a million dollar endowment in our foundation in five years. We are not there. We only have 450000 in cash. Sitting there draw, throwing out interest every year right now and now being able to pr pay programs. You build that $1 million endowment, then all of a sudden you've got some money to play with each and every year to secure that, that thing. So we put endowment building as a major, major thing in what we're trying to do. This is basically what we show as a, a graphic of what an umbrella looks like. It, it supports everything uh, in all different areas, but it, it, you only need one. Everybody still has their own say. They control their own area. It's really a financial accounting procedure that everything goes in there. It has to be well managed. It's a business. Record keeping is important. We talk about you know, what are the short-term tasks of you? or anybody that wants to build this, we need to build a great infrastructure. It has to be functional. We have to be part of the EITC. You have to do some special events, and you have to monthly meeting, but the most important, as I refer to it, takes work. It doesn't come easy. We have fun. We, have, we do a session one day a month every year, or every month out. This year happens to be out in Harrisburg. Last month we spent whole day on special events. Last Friday we spent a whole day on EITC. I said, if you just pay attention for two months, these two dates, when you're out there when we go through the presentation, in, night, in the year 2012 you should be able to generate $100,000 with those two programs alone. Now we laugh. There's a lot of fun. We have more fun than anything else in our special event. My vice president is from New Jersey. And, you know, six years ago when we first got together, he said, Bob, I want to talk about our chili cook-off. I go, right, Keith, you're not doing it. And he kept coming back to me, and he said, I want to talk about the chili cook-off. Well, it's a ha-ha. I've been to the chili cook-off. The chili cook-off nets $102,000 a year. I only use net dollars. We don't let people present anything that uh, doesn't generate 
more than fifty thousand dollars net. And these are small, you know, foundations. These are small places where he lives. Their school district's two thousand kids. So you know, we we can overcome. And the big thing about all our foundations, they share with one another. If you're close enough to Podstown, you may remember <laughs> that they did a thing called Dancing so with the Stars. Where they get Dancing with Stars idea? From Camden, New Jersey's foundation. I took them over there. Here they are. They shared all that information. We share among our foundations more than you want to believe. What we're trying to do is really have long-term success. This is the beginning, and you have to start to learn how to grow every single year. If you generated, you know, ten thousand dollars. You know, next year it's going to be twenty. I had that misfortune. Uh, I had this, I ran two hundred and fifty salespeople across the country. At the end of the year, I was very excited because we had sold our sale. We, we were up eighty-five million dollars worth of product, and I was all pumped up. I see the president. You know what his words were to me? You think you can do a hundred million next year? He didn't say thank you, great. He said, can you do a hundred thousand? That's our mentality. That's where you have to be. So that's what you're looking at, and you can get it done. Went through that. We learn from every other people, all the ones, the Camp Hill, or Phoenixville, or Northtown, why I'm missing Pottstown, plus all the things that, that we had. I want to tell you, I think, about how important it's, uh, what it's all about. I want to back up a little bit. In the last three months, I've heard from more superintendents and school boards than I have in the last four years. Irony, last week, I had phone calls from every single day, and to include Saturday, from a foundation or somebody that wanted to talk to us. I don't know if we know where the tipping point is, but I start to think I can see it. And it's going to happen more and more. The decision is going to be made. Do you want to have success? Yes, you can be successful, because there's ways we hold your hand. Literally, literally hold your hand for a year to make sure that you don't fail. Why we've seen the failures, lack of leadership, boards are too big. But the one down, biggest one I see, ego. Personal agenda. And I see it. And I will sometimes address it. I've been to meetings where I've seen foundation boards and I see somebody get up and talk. And I said, time out. It's not about you. It's about the boys and girls. But I see it every time. So if you can fight all those little things, you're going to have the potential of having a great foundation. We, you know, how to do it better, how to do it. We're there. We're there to support you. We have more documentation than we talk about a click of the mouth. I think Gary understands that. He asked me, do you have a question? I said, well, hang up. Five minutes, you'll have the answer. And it might be a 20-page document. We've done that. It collected. It's best practices. So we have everything you possibly need. Final thought. It's called simply work. And it's a business. It doesn't get any different than that. We talk about all the things that we do to support uh, in any type of situation we might be there to help you. As I said, it, uh, and the last thing we, we always talk about, it's about the kids. Not about you, not about Bob New, but about your kids. Now I can answer questions. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Thank you. About how much? <clears throat> about how much what? To get this rolling, to get it started. Depends. There's no it's like different different cars, right? Okay. Well, it's still work. a cost. It's still a cost, okay. yes. So at what point do we start to actually make money after we get you funded and running? Or helping us run? And, um, you know, how much, when do you start to get money? Yeah, I mean, we're going to, I mean, obviously there's an upfront cost that we sure. need to provide. I'm trying to get an idea of what that ballpark, what that upfront cost is. Because you told us if we can look at once we're up and running and running properly, we could be looking at, what, eighty to $100,000. Mm -hmm. What is our initial... It depends where you want. I'll give you a, a ballpark. It, it could run between nine thousand and twenty thousand, and that's back. That's over a year. We don't. We don't rate people. I need that money now. 
I, I feel your pain. So when we do something like that, it's spread out over a year. Can you and get we've your done money when we start making money? Pardon? Can you get your money when we start making money? Can I get my money? No. The other thing, no, no, the other no. thing that we talked about in the Revenue Enhancement Committee meeting with Bob knew was there. I mean, there's also, also the cost of an executive director. That's a big cost. That's a okay, big so and that's that's the main driver of of the success of any foundation. So you have to get the right person, and you got to pay them to do the job. So you may not see a return on that investment in in both his company and in the executive director for a certain period of time. Um, but it's, I want to be on fast track, mm -hmm. okay? The goal is to raise money more than anything else. Just so you know, you already have a foundation, okay? You could be qualified for EITC probably within the next 10 days. We don't have a foundation. Mr. Uh, we don't have a foundation. You have another foundation. It's a foundation. Yeah. But it's not ours. It's, it's a public it's, foundation. Well, it's not, it's, no, you have, that's what has to go through. Yeah. The school district doesn't have its own foundation. That's what I'm saying. Private foundation. That private, private foundation. foundation. That's what I'm saying. We don't have a foundation. Could be aligned into an EICT program. Mr. Newt, step us through the, the process here. You, say you were to get involved to help us um, get, get this foundation up and running. Um, what's the process that you would go through? What would you do? And, First I, I, I mean, obviously you'd look for an executive director. Mm -hmm. So you would go out and recruit for us. We're yeah. recruit for the foundation, not for us. Right. Basically, what we're saying is the school district would loan this new foundation seed money to get itself started, self-sustainable, okay. and then that money would come back to us. Is the basic right. concept. Basically, I, we've done this in many occasions. We call it a loan. So that, that a, seed money, that loan could be anywhere upwards to $20,000. Yeah. And our ROI, we don't know, but we hope our ROI would come back within the next fiscal year. Yeah. Uh, the executive director. Let's, let's take the executive director. That executive director is not a Daniel Boone school district employee, correct? No. Okay. What is the typical salary of one of these individuals? Right now, and we're looking at that's another variable for you. But I'll tell you, our, our standard when we go out and look for the first time, it's a three day a week job. Okay, they're under what we call a 1099 independent contractor, and we can hire them normally for between twenty five and thirty thousand dollars. And we've done that quite often. That's, what that's a recurrent annual cost to the district. Yeah. Uh, to, no. To the no, 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 no. That's to the, the cost to the, to to the, the foundation. The foundation. Okay. But they better be able to make your salary. Remember, I say we look and coach with them. If they're not doing the job within three months, we're going to go out and go start all over the process again. This is a business. That's the biggest thing I want you to You don't play games. This is a business. They don't do it, get out. Start with somebody well, else. I, I understand that part. My, my, I'm trying to get to the point where, you know, we're looking at having to, to loan twenty and twenty nine thousand, depending upon where you go, so that you receive money. Mm -hmm. you to receive money. <coughs> we we expect to recoup that back. Right. Okay. Out of the foundation that this gentleman's running, we being the benefactors of that foundation, totally. he needs to make at least twenty five to thirty thousand to pay for himself. Right. And then everything above and beyond that, we end up getting. Right. Okay. The foundation's sole objective is to support the school district. Right. Period. So I mean, as long as as long as he's able to do his twenty five thousand to pay for himself, and he does another five, he does a total of thirty annually. Mm -hmm. We we benefit five hundred thousand dollars off of that. Hopefully, he does more than that because we'd like he to get that hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand dollars. I just told you the parameters. Right. Yeah. You know, first year, you know, third year. That's what they should be doing. That, and you have to say, this is what you need to do. They know that going in. We're, they are told, this is what your goals are. So school district this size, what would you, in your expertise, see as a successful complement of that foundation? Is it a six-person <coughs> group? Is it a, what is it? What you are, mean the foundation the board? The board. Of people that you would want to be on that foundation? Foundation board is another is issue that we look at, and uh, less is more. I wouldn't, we do not recommend boards more than nine people. Now, there's committees, which are you know, not the board members, but they're the working committees. But the board itself, and where all the problems are, I've seen boards with 30 people. I've been to meetings with people with 30 people. They have no idea. So we basically say less is more. We're looking at nine people. And they are, they are about researched and qualified as the same as the executive director. We go through another 
situation. We always say, oh, he's a nice guy. Let's put him on the board. I go, no, 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 no. What's his skill set? What can he do? You know, love him to death. He might be a great person. You're selecting that board the same way you select an executive director. Those are paid positions also. Pardon? Those are paid positions also or volunteer positions on yeah. the board. Yeah. Yeah. Paid? The board volunteer. No, they're the volunteers. Okay. Just for the benefit of the board and the public that's listening, um, that board that we're describing now is not this school board. It's a separate, standalone foundation board. And most of the general public misconstrue when they say, you know, they assume the foundation board is the school board. And I, there's a lot of times we have to explain that away. And that's part of, you know, what we do is our case for support that we have to tell the general public, no, foundation board is a separate standalone organization. It is not the school board. It's an issue, so we need public support once it's out there and, you know, knowing what you're doing on that. Um, the seed money that, that Mr. Sermonero talked about obviously is the, the search the search money, right, to go out and look for this executive director, mm -hmm. okay? At that point there, the executive director does not get paid unless he actually brings the money in, correct? It's no. not like we're going to pay him. He gets paid on a weekly salary. Okay, so we're going to pay him whether he generates any money or not. Correct. Foundation so we're not... Pays. I know. School board doesn't pay. Mm -hmm. School board says, here's, here's, here's a check, and I'm giving this check to the foundation. Right. Now it's up to the foundation to manage that money and to do what they need to do to grow it. But, 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 we're we're betting beginning. on the come that but in that's the beginning, going to happen. Okay, we're, we're, we're going to give them $20,000 20, $20, a seed money. Okay? Okay. No, it's not. It, what it is is a loan. Okay, we're loaning well, no, let's get it no, 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 no. This is a business. It's a loan. Signed, sealed, and delivered. They have to that. pay back to the school district. I just said that. We're loaning this foundation $20,000. Right. Okay? Now, when that when you, you hire, when you do your search for the executive director, mm -hmm. where does that money come from for that search? That's my fee, or our fee that we charge. That was a nine thousand dollar fee. Oh, okay, so now it, it's okay. So but, but now let's, you know, it, I don't. Nothing's up front. I, I understand that, but I'm trying to get okay. a grasp on, on on where this is going and the flow is, as we're talking about here. Okay, so we 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 loan this foundation twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Okay, you go out and, and, and your your fee set aside. Mm -hmm. You go out and you find us an executive director, so he gets paid for the sake of argument. Two thousand dollars a week mm -hmm. for the ten week. He's got ten weeks worth of salary oh, no, built no, no, up no, no, in that no, no, seed no, no, money, correct? No, 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 no. He's getting paid about five hundred dollars. I use it as an argument, okay. just, just as a point use of whatever you okay. want. He's got ten weeks of salary before there's no more money left in that foundation, unless he brings money in, correct? No, it's a business. You know, you're going to, some of it's in speculation. I mean, if you were, to, you know, you, you, first of all, the money's spread out over a year, okay? You know, and you're going to watch him go through some of this, and you're going to see what he's doing or she's doing. It's not we don't you don't pay him up front. You don't even you're, pay you're, me. You're missing my point, okay? And I'm trying to be very clear, and I'm not sure if I'm you're missing not. this point, okay? You're not. You're off base. I'm going to be honest. I told you. This is the, the salary that you're going to pay that person spread out over one year. Okay, I'm going to try one more time, very slowly. So I'm going to do this so that okay, because I've got to understand this if you're going to get one of the nine votes on the board here, okay. If we're going to go forward, we give you seed money. Okay, we're going to loan. You give the foundation. Gonna, okay. Okay. We're, we're going to play semantics, but we're going to give the foundation seed money. Correct. Okay, it's a loan, it's whatever good. you want to call it. They got twenty thousand dollars of Daniel Boone money. Mm -hmm. You hire an executive director. Correct. Okay. Your payment comes spread out through the year. That's that. We're not going to worry about how you get paid to hire that director right now. Okay. Okay. Now that director you just said gets paid a weekly salary. Okay. If his weekly salary is five hundred dollars, to make because you five hundred bucks, he draws off of that seed money that we've loaned. Right. Okay. If he doesn't bring any money in, when that seed money's gone, he doesn't get paid any longer. That wouldn't happen because I would have cut his, I would have cut him. Okay. Six that's months. That's my point. Him. That's my point, though. If that part of my deep, part of my deal is I coach and mentor for nine months. Okay. So I, you know, I'm pretty tough, and if that person is not doing the job, not bringing money, in, I'm going to say, "Hey, you're just not making it." 
but <coughs> most honestly, the people we bring in, they're pretty well ready to go. <coughs> I think the I, issue you have to also consider is, you know, the district has sort of been here before, right? Four, five, six years ago, there was a foundation that was created. Um, it was funded by, I believe, the, the boosters organizations. And the district then had to sort of step no, in. It wasn't funded at all. It was 100% funded. No. no, no, no. There was money that was put into the foundation. And it was put in by the boosters. Yes, it was. I've seen the accounts. I sat on the board, okay? So the money was funded by the boosters organizations. This district then had to come in and support the, the foundation to keep it going. And so there was an investment of time and resources from the district to uh, provide a website, develop that website, support that website. There was uh, time and investment by the school district to put into the meetings. There was time of investment of the school district to um, solicit names and help them. I, I'm well aware okay, of the so that Okay, so any, any business is going to require an investment, and it's going to take a year or two years to get a return on that investment. I'm well aware. I wanted to know how this one functioned. Okay, and I kept getting loan, and then I wanted to know exactly so that we all understood that we are providing money to start this organization up. This gentleman who would be hired is being paid from that money, at which time he starts bringing revenue in. I just wanted to make sure that was clear, and that was my whole point of trying to get. And, it is, and it is knowing it is a risk. Correct. Well, I'm not. Bottom line, it's risk. a risk. I mean, everything's a risk, but I mean, well, I think Mr. New just said that. Um, he's going to be working with the man or woman, whoever's in charge in that, for you know, for the first nine months. So after two months, I think you would have a pretty good idea if you selected the right candidate. If not, you're cutting that person loose. You're moving on to the next person. To, to Correct, try but, and fill but the again, you lost that two months. You lost that two months. Mr. Again, Mr. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. But you're no problem. Not denying that. I'm saying that. The, 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 the e EITC. Is it unreasonable to think that we can get twenty thousand dollars out of the EITC? If you work, I mean, I'm not, not a, a candidate. You can be, I can get you approved, or we can get you approved by the end of March. So you have, you know, April, May, and June to go out and solicit money. I start right now. If you're committed, I'll give it to you. That, this is our program that we do for all our foundations. It's, it's for education foundations, how to go out and make money. I'm just trying to see some sense of it, it, how, how and when we could get our investment back. It was That's average. what I'm trying to get to. I didn't see your so is it unreasonable to think you could get that back? It depends the on too many variables. Remember I told you i got a couple of things that are raising millions and a couple that don't do anything. It depends, and mostly it's going to depend on who that uh, exec is and how you move them forward. Do you see the small baskets to go out and grab versus the large ones? What do you mean? As far as I don't bringing, what bringing funds in, what's a small basket? Well, fifty thousand, seventy-five. You get, you take whatever you can get. Well, true. Well, that's what I'm saying. And you look at you look at all the your great your your potential people. This is a. I think you guys also have to realize. I mean, we, it's not like we're starting from scratch. I mean, last year the Revenue Enhancement Committee put together a list of all the all the alumni who have graduated from Daniel Boone, and it's in electronic files. Okay. The, the foundation that was is out there now had started to put some work together. We have uh, at our resources the ability to put up a website. Um, there's certain things that we can do to stump, jump start this. There's vendors that we work with currently that, you know, quite frankly, are wi wi able, willing, and ready to donate money to this school district tomorrow if we just ask. Our, our, our solicitor's firm, Fox Rothschild, they have a fund set up specifically to make ter charitable donations to school districts. Every We've never asked them. You know, every bank in this state is up to their eyeballs in the EITC program. The company I work for donates to school districts. Well, I know they do. But I'm just uh, saying, but we know, never I'm ask. Point. All I, wanted, I mean, we got a ton of people out here right now that, that hurt budgets. and are from, I want to know, and I think we, we finally got it, what is our upfront cost? It could be $50,000. But you got, I think you have to look at it as a sunk cost. You may never get the money back. But sitting around and doing nothing, you're not going to raise any money either. And we've tried this for four or five years that I've been on the board to no success whatsoever. We could probably work off a deferred payment, a deferred salary with the executive director, right? What do you mean? I mean, they don't have to get paid day one. They, get, they can come the first, in as a volunteer the week. with a deferred salary yeah. if it's No, successful. it's the first week. You need to, you, you're paying them on a thing. Uh, why? I mean, why? why? 
Why can't they come in as a, as a volunteer? <coughs> Would you take the job? I mean, cash. that's a question. Would you take that job? It's deferred, though. If he's, good, if he's good, he knows he's good. Correct. It's not like they're doing it for free. That, that's not business. That's, or a percentage of what they get. That's not allowed. Oh, well, yeah, that's not that's, that's an ethical thing in nonprofit world. Yeah. Okay. 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 But then defer payment, why not? Well, I think... One of the things, I mean, I, I understand you guys are questioning. We're not in the, in the fundraising business. I don't know about any of you, but, I mean, I participated in fundraisers, but I don't run a 503C organization. I mean, that's the whole point, I think, of reason why we brought somebody in who's been successful at doing this. And we can, I think, it's good, they're good questions to ask, you know, in terms of pushing back and, and trying to under, understand the rationale. But to rework the model, a model that's already successful, I don't think that's, what our role here is. Either we're going to work with, with a company like this one and we're another one that has a model that's successful and works and that's why you're paying them the money you're paying them or you're not going to work with a model that he's proposing and you're going to do something else. And if and I don't know what the alternative is, but... Can you talk a little bit, I've, I researched this a little bit before, and are you talking about the Educational Improvement Tax Credit Program mm -hmm. and this is what you send out to companies... Um, no, that comes from that, that document comes from DCED, Department of Community Economic Development. It has the application for the businesses in it. Okay. That's all it is. And on something that I heard, you said you have businesses already, a list of businesses that you have contacted in the past? And I don't contact them, but I have the list that have contributed to the EITC in the number of over 4,000. I can break down Bucks County or Berks County, any one of them. We have somehow we have access. I don't tell you how I get access, mm -hmm. but of the companies that that are participating in EITC, there's there's over four thousand of them. As I said, every bank in this state is up to their eyeballs in, in, in giving out you know funds and things like that. There's a lot of people. I was uh, right down the street. Route ten is Penske. Penske gives over a hundred thousand dollars a year through the EITC program. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get it, but somebody should be able to knock on their door and say, hey, you got employees up in the Daniel Boone School District. You go to Sovereign Bank. you got, you know, your, your banks here. Who's your depository bank? You know, they're the people that, that you got to start to talk. This is not, it goes back, it, it sounds childish. It's called work. People won't come throwing money at you. I guarantee you that. Is this something that you suggest to businesses to fill out so they can get on the list so that we can get their exactly. money? Exactly. Okay. But you said if you, uh, something by the end of March, if you get moved, is it something, there was monies available via EITC already? Is that? I think what he was saying is that we could be approved for this program. You have to be approved for it. Yeah. Yeah. What happened, let, let me give you a little bit. On July the 1st, this will be July 2nd because it's a Monday. Is the first day that the corporations can give request funds for tax credits. Okay, at the end of that day, all the money is going seventy-five million dollars. So that's what we're looking for. I can tell you that you go. All you have to say to these business, we will be approved even early on for to receive tax credit dollars. That's all they want to know. March. Huh? Pardon? So you described it would be it could be approved by the end of March. No, this foundation oh, could be approved yeah. by DCED by the end of March. That's it. Okay. okay. Or soon. Okay. It's, it's a simple four-page application. One of the things we talk about, and one of the they have some very the, the, what programs get approved are called advanced academic. Uh, uh, but I tell our foundations, submit one in all your AP programs because. This program will pay for textbooks, teacher, and tests. What that does, if you get money in, just takes money out of that part of the treasury and moves it someplace else. But that's one that will get approved automatically. You can have as many as you want. The corporations could care less. They could care less what programs you have approved. All they want is their tax credit. The tax credit, very simply, is this. If, if a corporation gives $10,000, they get $19,000 back. How do you do it? First of all, foundations of 501c3, that's your federal taxes. The state of Pennsylvania says we'll give you 90% of what you donate back to you as a tax credit. Why is it sold out in one day? You know, $48 million disappeared one day. They line up at doors and you just hope you don't get oversubscribed. 
but this is some of the things that, that we do. I, it's hard to explain all of it. This is what I do every day. Every day I'm trying to get another foundation approved. Same way you are. To get started, is it, is it, is it a loan or is it an expense? Can it be an expense rather than a loan? You, that's your deal. I mean, you can do whatever you want to do. Some, it doesn't bring any money in. It's an expense. Well, uh, but rather than saying it's thirty, you know, if I did the math, it's about thirty-six thousand a year, right? right? Rather than thirty-six thousand a year, seven hundred seventy-five dollars a week. Well, you, you get you get money out every week, get it going, and then you know, in in a month or two, then there's money already, or there, there's money or something coming in at that particular point. That then you're you're basically offsetting the investment to get it started. Is what what I was. thinking. Not what do you what do you mean a year? It's not a year. Once. Well, he's, he's, he's amortizing oh. the payments. He's just, okay. I'm, I'm amortizing. I thought you said per You know, and if you can if year. you can expense it rather than here's thirty six thousand yeah. dollars, it, it could be here's a significant cost. Seven seventy five a week. Right. 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 Yeah. Then all of a sudden, you know, you hit you hit something, it hits fifteen grand. All of a sudden, you, you're, you're done giving. Now you've got you got six months. You're you're on your own. You're self sufficient now. Bob, a question I wanted to ask, um, if hypothetically this went forward, how long would it take you to have, one, an executive director, and two, um, a, a board that meets the qualifications that you described earlier? Um, the executive director was, on average, it would be done within a month. Within a month. That's, that's putting... Uh, the information out, interviewing, getting resumes, and then you guys making the final decision. How about finding the nine, seven, six, five board members? That's you, you, you people right here have the names in your pocket. Start putting, you know, who do you, you want people that have skill sets in a specific area, we can give you those, you know, who are going to be dedicated to doing certain things. We'll give you some areas of what you should be looking for and, and go from there. And you could have those done within a month. What does, and again, I mean, this, this may be, I'll try to phrase this so it doesn't come off wrong here. What is this individual doing the other time? I mean, $20,000 or $25,000 of, of, of an income isn't, isn't, a, isn't a lot for three. I mean, understand for three. What's he doing for the other two days? Uh, Where is he coming from? I mean, uh, I'm trying to figure out what, what are you going to get for $25,000? What do you, most of them are girls. Excuse me, females. Okay, okay. No, no males. Uh, usually, they're single. Their their moms, their husband has their health insurance program underneath this. This is a history we find. You know, they still have children in school. They may want to do that. They want to get and they and they basically have experience in the nonprofit world. I mean, that's what we look for, and and that's basically <laughs> what you're bringing. But then you say to them, you know, what do you want to do? I mean, then you become the peer. Do you really want to expand? Do you want to do more? You know, you bring in more money, we can pay you more money. If you want to work five days, you know, for X, and if you're doing the job, it's just a, it's a business decision you make at that point. Other questions from board members? Any questions from the public? Please come up to the podium. You have to state your name and your address. Yes, my name is Jeannie Barris, and I live at 2334 East Main Street here in Douglasville. Um, I, too, have read The Tipping Point by Malcolm Caldwell. It's a very good book. I live by the practices. Um, my interpretation from what you presented here, and if you don't mind for a second, could you go back to the previous slide of the presentation? <laughs> So, the way that I interpret this, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong in this, I deem this as you being a headhunter to find somebody to come into a position to help to utilize their strengths in the nonprofit world to secure money that will help the school district to grow. Am I correct in that? Other than I'm not a headhunter. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. But, but you're correct in, in, in basically. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
And from what I gathered, you have to mentor this particular person for six to nine months. You did say that, correct? Okay. So in other words, what I understood and listened to your presentation, if you bring this person on right away, and the school district pays for this person, they're realistically not up and functioning the very first day. Is that don't correct? Bet on, don't bet on it. That, the day I take, the day she's hired, guaranteed, I, there's a plan for her. Okay, People, it's, it's not instantaneous. I understand Okay, that. but right there, the day she's hired, then she becomes, I'm the coach. These are the things we want to do now. We have a whole plan for for nine months. Okay. All right. So you're going to have this person in place. And do you have a standard set of long-term goals that creates a level of uniformity? So basically what I'm saying to you is you go from foundation to foundation to foundation and you present the same plan from foundation to foundation to foundation. That's wrong. I'm I custom, sorry? It's customized. It's customized. Because your demographics, student population, and everything else, I just did Great Valley. You're not like Great Valley. So their demographics are different. I customize everything to what I believe can be done in this area. We do this day in and day out, 24-7. Okay. You know, I have, we have documentation. We have other people that are all part of this big program. It's just not me. Okay. okay? But, you know, short-term, long-term, medium-term goals, they're the goals, and they're going to sit down and agree to them. This is, what, this is a business. If, you weren't, if I didn't treat my salespeople like that, you know, seven, eight years ago, they wouldn't have been doing good. This is a business, and I'm teaching them this is the best way for you to be successful. This is the best way for the Daniel Boone Foundation to be successful. It's not black and white. Okay. Okay, so we're at, we're at three minutes. Um, I have to limit your questions to that. I'm sure you can contact Bob New after the meeting. Okay. Okay, but I got to let, if we got other people who want to get up and speak and we got to get through the rest of the meeting, I got to limit to three minutes. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Suzanne Hi. Miller, um, for any Eagle Speaker of Douglasville. Just a quick question about the EITC. I was just looking online. It said that applications open July 1st of each year. Pardon? Did your applications for the EITC for uh, nonprofits open on July 1st of each year? No, that's the date that the corporations submit their applications for funds. For funds? For them to, to be able to donate their tax credit funds. Right. Um, what I was reading that it opened on July 1st and it fully, it was fully exhausted by July 8th. So That's wrong. That's wrong. July 8th is a, a different date for S Corporation. Remember, these are basically big corporations. It's called a pass-through corporation. Pass -through. Money's all gone by July 8th. Money's gone on July 1st. Right. Well, that's what I'm just trying to get clarified that what you're presenting here is that my assumption was money was available throughout the year. But no, 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 no. I said it's exhausted on July 1st. Actually, it's July 2nd this year. So nonprofits have to be very savvy no. about working no, no, with wait. the... Found 501c3 foundations. Nonprofits aren't 501c3s. They're the only ones that can be approved. I, you know, on my board, you know, on our board, the guy's name's Ted Noor. Ted was the executive director of the tax credit program for the first 12 years. We probably have the best resources in the world. So, you know, what you read and what we know, is, or, you know, but July 1st is when all the corporations submit their application requesting money for tax credits to be used. Max us out of $300,000. And, and July 8th is when? July 8th is a pass-through thing. It go, it, it, see, I can get complicated. It's only going to work on scholarship <coughs> organizations, which we are not part of, uh, because there's still money left on their side of the table. Uh, and, and that's about it. I guess my general question is, there's all through the year, if this gets set up for the district, that there would be possibility that money can be acquired through this EITC? Once you're approved, and, you know, you know, and then you just renew every year, that's all. And you can add new programs and, and delete programs and things like that, as long as they approve them in Harrisburg. 
they have to be advanced academic type of program. And we show you which ones they are. Does the tax have a limit of what they allow? Yes. Okay. No bricks and mortar, no remedial. There's a lot in there, but that's what we do. So I'm in a cap of how much they'll allow to be tax credit and not go into their coffers. Pardon? I meant uh, allow how much they will allow to be donated as a general amount to as many IITs. They can, people can donate as much as they so there's want. there's no cap then? No cap, no cap for the foundation. No cap for the foundation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else from the public? Okay. So Any other? Question. When, yeah. If we decide to go this route with the foundation, um, if we start time, I mean, again, may, I'm sure you may over, or the chair has, do we have to go to an RFQ and RFP for this, or can we just go with a single organization if we deem fit to do this? I think that's a question for the solicitor. Okay. I mean, that, that's a question. I mean, again, I think I mean, if we decide we want to go with the route of at least at a foundation and foundation. Remember, we're, we're giving what the money to a, found, a, a separate what legal entity, and they're going to hire based right. on his question. But I think we need your experience with that. So we, I, I would think you can give a loan to whoever you want. Okay. I think the one conclusion that we came up with in the Revenue Enhancement Committee is this district can't afford not to have a foundation. Right. How we do that. that is how is what I think we all need to decide. Um, <clears throat> Mr. New was kind enough in November to come talk to us once so we had some background information and asked him to come back now. But regardless of what direction we go in, we, we can't afford not to have a functioning foundation anymore. We're, we're throwing money away. I'm not disagreeing with that. Just make we decide to go that yep, we no, the right way and we do yep, it as quick as we can if we're going to do it. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. New. We Thank appreciate you, your appreciate help. It. Thank you. If anybody wants to ask a question, I'll stay here for outside. I'll turn off the five minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, so we're going to move on with the agenda. Um, moving on to item number six, curriculum instruction. Uh, is there anything to report out of the CNI committee? Um, we, had a real, we had a very quick meeting. Um, the only thing that came out is we did bring a, a full recommendation to accept the balance of um, Mr. McElroy's document. Um, he had gone and done what we asked him to do. Um, you know, each subject came up with their own ability to waive and to give a waiver to move up into the other court, which we had asked him to do. They did that very well. Um, went from no waiver to subject-based waiver. So. What we wanted, so it was done by Okay, good. All right, well, and we'll be we'll be voting on that tonight when we get to the end of the meeting. Right. We'll bring that up. And we'll do a we'll we'll adjourn this meeting temporarily. Have a voting meeting. We'll vote on it and then get that done. Okay. Uh, BCTC. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Um, first, we're going to start with uh, some of the questions that have been asked about how the district quote is arrived at. Um, Basically, what uh, BCTC does is look at the student population of the 16 participating schools from ages 9th grade to 11th grade. And they total that up, and that includes all the, the public, private, homeschool, and even cyber school uh, kids. They total that up uh, this past year. The, that, cap, that total was 11,375. And what they do, they, they also uh, take uh, the percentage of uh, Danny Boone, which is, uh, we were 914.55, and basically what you do is you divide the uh, the number of Boone by the total number, it gives you a percentage, which our percentage this year happened to be 8.04%. Um, and then you take that 8.04% and they multiply that mm -hmm. the whole by the total number of seats available at BCTC, which is 2060. And 8% of that number is 166. 166 is Daniel Boone's um, uh, quota for what they can send um, up to BCTC. We can send more than that, and there's no cost of the no additional cost of the district um, for the first year. I want to point that out, but there's no uh, there would be no restrictions on, on that. Um, so that's how. Uh, uh, but just for some information, also the. Uh, Three-year average for Boone. Um, let's see, what is it? All right, I can tell you, Boone has 102 students enrolled so far as of October of 2011. Um, but what would happen is, if you would continue 
to increase in the number of kids we send to BCTC, there would be an increase in the amount of funds that we would be responsible for as part of our proportional chair, which I'll get into later. So there would be no impact on the budget the first year, but in subsequent years, as lower amounts drop off that three-year average and you get a higher number, the higher numbers are going to be uh, a different percentage that we would be responsible for. So hopefully that's, hopefully that's crystal clear. Um, now for our proportion, uh, proportionate district share, which is how much of the total BCTC budget Daniel Boone is responsible for, uh, what we do, or what they do is um, they take the, the average, you, you need, first of all, you need some numbers. You need to know what your individual school's three-year attendance average is. You need to know um, what the, the average BTC, BCTC's three-year school seating is. Um, and what how that's arrived at is they add up all the students that are uh, sent to the Career and Technology Centers from all the participating districts. They subtract any students that districts have exceed their quota, so they subtract those students from that number. Um, they add that all up, and right now that uh, for, for this coming year, the average for what they, what they call that, the average daily membership is 1,516 and a whole bunch of decimal points. And um, for the last three years, um, Daniel Boone's uh, average ADM has been 99.6. So what you do, you take that, um, you take those two numbers, you divide the uh, um, 1,516 by the 99, 639, and you get a 6.5% uh, share. So that 6.5% share is what Daniel Boone is responsible for the total budget of BTC to TC once all the revenue sources are deducted from that. So that be there's some federal sources, obviously some state sources, and whatever remains, uh, that's what we're responsible for. Uh, this year, the BTC uh, BCTC budget was what 11 million three hundred twenty thousand, and um, that represents a, a cost uh, to uh, Daniel Boone of seven hundred forty three thousand seven hundred twenty four dollars, which uh, which is approximately. 8,390 less than last year, and that's principally because um, they're not offering math any longer at the, uh, at the career and technology centers. That's something that going to 12, 13 year school year, all the participating schools will be taking back. Um, there, there was only three, um, I believe, that were uh, uh, enrolling in that were one of the three. Um, so, this, this, so that's primarily due to the um, you know, the decrease, although the increase in the, the budget for the uh, um, Career and Technology Center has been pretty substantial for the uh, health care costs and their retirement was also a, a big increase in the uh, PCTC budget. But, but there was, because of the removal of the MAP program and the furlough of a lot of the teachers that were responsible for that, it actually is a, is a, a lower number this year. Um, in other news, on Gen I'm going to go out kind of out of uh, order here. Um, out on January 25th, um, there was a joint operating committee meeting. Um, we had the following things, uh, highlights. We discussed the preliminary budget, um, the official announcement of the elimination of the math program, which I just mentioned. Um, one of the big things that have come up was during their PDE Chapter 339 educational audit, it was pointed out to them that there's a lot of the students don't have, are not getting the minimal amount of instruction time uh, at the school, and so that was a finding, and they had to set, submit a response to the state for uh, for how to correct that. Um, what the minimum is is two and a half two and a half hours of instructional time is the minimum. Um, so that, that's one of the big uh, big things for the participating districts in the, in the coming year. Um, it's especially uh, concerning that some of the schools that had the biggest problem of not meeting the minimum number were schools that had recently or um, maybe a year or two in the past had removed themselves from the math program. Now we're going to be in that situation in the coming years. So 
that's that's a concern that we have as well is to make sure that the uh, in the 12 and 13 that the students that we're sending to BCPC are meeting the minimum uh, um, instructional time there. Mr. Wolf, we discussed that at the curriculum instruction, and Mr. Atwell uh, <coughs> is going to pull those students out early from their last period, get them in the lunch and on the bus to get them there to give them at least two and a half hours. Okay. It's whether right. or not BCI is going to accept them. Ten minutes after they want them or not is, is going to be a point, but they'll have at least two and a half hours mm -hmm. in the plan that you set forward. Well, there were some uh, guidelines that were submitted to the district for like the recommended start and dismissal time for both morning and afternoon. I don't know. Well, you know, what part, part of that was they wanted us to get them there so they could then sit and eat lunch. Mm. We didn't make a lot of sense <coughs> to no, get them I, on I, the bus. No. Well, again, with the documentation that you provided to the curriculum instruction committee, the IU is requesting that they eat lunch there. And PCTC. Right. Yeah, right. But that didn't come off in the meeting. Right? Well, maybe not, but the documentation was forwarded to the building principal it was. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to feed them at our buildings and then send them on the way. It doesn't take kids more than 10 minutes. I believe there were some districts that had the same. Concerns. There were a number of districts that had the same issues. So. Yeah, there, there was a, a few of them already had made the corrections to that is what I'm told. So... You know, yeah. As long as we're meeting the minimum, um, and uh, th this is one of the this, this schedule was was handed out to the district as far as you know what the recommended start time for morning and afternoon classes were. Can so, you send? Can you scan that in and send that around yeah, the board? I'll, I'll do that. I understand. Was this Dr. Otter, Was this in? Yeah, was this in the packet of information that Dr. Lee's had given you? Oh, I would have to see it, and and I, and I don't exactly know, but I'll make sure the board gets it. This and did you mention that he's? Question, did yes, you I, mention that he's coming? I missed that while I was. I haven't got that. Far. Okay. Do we have a date? We do have a date for the evening for a meeting for the board. Well, that's that's a that's in April. That's in April. But I I think <laughs> Mike's going to talk about. You're stealing on my thunder. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. All right. um, okay. So I, hopefully that uh, hopefully we made some progress on that. Um, this is a this is a big one as well. A common school calendar. That's probably high in the sky short term, but it's something that uh, they feel is, is, is essential because uh, they're having some students, uh, obviously, that have an in-service day in their home districts, but the career and technology centers are open. And the students, while it's open, the students are still required to get there. Um, I know it's, it's, again, trying to get 16 districts to agree on anything is probably impossible, but... I mean, it's none, nonetheless, it's still one of their goals. Um, it's been a long-standing issue. Yeah, that's I, I, I got that. I got that feeling also. Uh, the next meeting is the February twenty-second meeting, and uh, we we'll believe we'll be uh, going into uh, voting on the the preliminary budget at that point. Um, now, back up one day, um, the twenty-fourth, which was the day after our last board meeting, uh, Mrs. Hamill and myself attended the signing ceremony at the Schmidt and Technology Center at uh, RAC, on RAC campus. And uh, at that point, it, the, uh, what was the creation of what was it's called the Technical Academy was uh, laid out to the public. Um, there was uh, press there. It was covered in the, in the Reading Eagle as well, and on Channel 69 News. Um, and uh, it was, it's uh, basically the Technical Ca Academy is a partnership between Reading, Muhlenberg, Votech, uh, um, the Berks Career and Technology Centers East and West, and the Reading Area Community College. Um, that's it's a partnership and uh, between those three. Um, in addition to the creation of the Technical Academy, um, they announced two additional offerings: one being a business, and another being an IT. Were added to the existing mechatronics uh, offerings that they they've had over for for a year now. Um, now, to get into a little bit more information, uh, I'll let Mrs. Hamill take it up from here. The, um, the classes that they added, the courses, the course of study, the computer technology degree, the business management degree, the computer technology degree, um, and the mechatronics engineering technology degree, all of which you can get college credit for. If you decide to go to these programs, what they're asking is that students have um, 
students must be in 10th grade or 11th grade to begin the program in the techni technical uh, in the academy. They have to have a 3.0 GPA. They have to be proficient in math from the PSSA. They have to be proficient in reading from the PSSA. Um, they have to have some, uh, let me see, and it's a RAC placement. Once you get into uh, BCTC and you have fulfilled the requirements, the one degree for computer technology degree, you can get six, 30, I'm sorry, 26 credits of college. Um, and this is at no cost to the parent. So if they go to BCTC and they start accumulating college credits, there's no cost there. You're getting, for the business management degree, you will receive 23 college credits. For computer, the other computer technology degree, you'll get 23 credits. And for the mechatronics engineering technology degree, you'll receive 27 credits. And these are all credits that are transferable to other colleges. When I talked to one of the principals today regarding the programs and why they're so important that maybe students look at them, and it was part of how the industry has started to change. They're saying that a lot of industries now are looking for students that are called, what they're calling, the gold, golden collar workers. And these workers and students that go through a technology program will have not only the technolo technological skills, they'll have, um, they're looking for soft skills, they're looking for students that are decision makers, and they're looking for, the, for some students that just have some college. If, if some students decide they don't know what they want to do in 10th grade, and they're thinking about going to college, and they're not aware that these programs are there, or parents aren't aware, that their, co their children could actually earn up to a year's worth of college credits at no cost to the parent. So it's a huge savings. When I was researching about the new trends in, in education, they're saying that the, the, the old time when our parents went to school, well, I, I'm going to look at my grandparents, my parents, got, a, got through high school, they went on to a job, they worked it for 35 years, they got the, uh, the uh, pension, they got it all, the medical. The education shows and the industry shows those jobs are not going to be available um, as much in the future, is what the, I was reading. And they said that, um, when I was talking to one of the principals, they said if you started in 10th grade, and you went through 10th grade, 11th grade at BCTC, and then in your senior year, you actually get credits directly from RAC, which would also get another, uh, it's called Math 106. Um, that's also more college credits in math. So if you decide to go to another institution, you can then move those credits over. Um, so you can actually almost end up with an associate's degree before you leave BCPC. And those are transferable college credits. So from the standpoint of if your students want to go to college or not, this might be a way to move them in, and they call it dual enrollment, and it's a way to move them in without cost to the parents, and it gets them the credits for college. Okay, they're, they're in almost their whole senior year, all their classes, when they're not at Daniel Boone, their classes will be at RAC. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and in the health field, they have a whole health section. Now, if you look at the, uh, if you see this book come home, I suggest you look at it. It's very interesting to hear and see everything that um, BCTC offers. Um, but in the health section of this book, you're going to also notice that when they, they'll actually go to Penn State Berks for their classes. And they also, once again, they get a, a registered nursing degree, a licensed practitioner's nurse or practical nurse, surgical technology, medical assistant, Nurses aides. I mean, it just goes on forever, and that your and that your kids will get credit for college while they're in high school. So it's just a way to maybe jumpstart them if they want to, and that's what I found out when I was at the meeting. This has been primarily thanks, Mike. Sure. Um, this has been uh, primarily driven by the Berks Senior Economic Partnership and the Berks County Workforce Investment Board. Um, 
you know, East Penn Manufacturing and uh, Car Tactics was two of the ones that, that, we, uh, that we were able to speak to that wanted, this, wanted to create the me mechatronics program, but simply for the fact that they're training people that would be desirable for them to hire. Um, so it is, uh, it really was something that was uh, very, uh, very enlightening. Um, okay, um, if anyone would like any more information, just to wrap this up, the, uh, there will be an information section, um, um, information uh, meeting at the uh, uh, RAC Schmidt Training and Technology Center on their campus uh, at 6.30 on uh, February the 23rd. So if you'd like to know more information about it, you could uh, certainly attend. If you have a ninth grader in the district, you probably, as I do, uh, they already received their packet on, uh, I got mine on Friday, so it was very timely that we were able to get it. So, um, so that's something that uh, you can look forward to. Uh, next, uh, um, as Dr. Otto had mentioned, on October, uh, excuse me, on March the 12th, Dr. Lees from BT, uh, BCTC will be here to address the board directly. That's it. Thank you. Do we have questions from the board for these guys on this issue? What was the date you said again? Which one? Which one? The date where he's going to come? Next well, committee of the whole. I, I think it's an excellent resource that that's out there, and you know, as a parent, I think you know if you can have your kids learn a skill set um, such as those that are being offered by BCTC, and you earn college credits at the same time. Um, you know, one that helps make you more marketable when you're applying to a college or a university to already have those credits under your belt, and two, it frees you up to take core classes in whatever field of study you actually want to take when you get there. Uh, you know, I, I believe a year's tuition at Penn State is somewhere over $20,000 right now. Uh, it's, quite a, it's quite a savings to parents uh, if they're looking to send their kids on to a post-secondary education. Um, did you guys find out, maybe we can have this discussion if um, Mr. McElmoyle will be prepared to talk about it at the Committee of the Whole meeting in March. What exactly are we doing to promote the BCTC program here at Daniel Boone. I think that's one of the things I'd like to have a better understanding of. What is it we're doing? Are there any recommendations Dr. Lees can have? Maybe we're doing all that we can. I don't know, but um, I don't think I've ever really heard about that in the four years that I've been on the board. But the principal said that the school guidance council should have received these books mm -hmm. by now and that students could pick them up from the guidance counselor. I have three of them here if anyone would like one tonight. I do have those. Um, so if they would like to look at them, but that's where it starts is in the guidance counseling and, and support from the superintendent and the high school principal. Okay. Any other questions from board members? Any questions from the public? certainly address that with Dr. Lees when he's here next month. That's a good that's question. That's something that's always concerned me. Mm -hmm. I, that, that's, yeah, we can certainly take that up with Dr. Lees. Any other adult in any building has to have clearances. We can check that out. Okay. That's a good point. Any other comment from the public? Great 
around uh, Woodland Road for referral. Uh, just a quick question on the BCTC program on the college credits. Is there a list of colleges in which the credits are good for and which programs? I can give you a book. You can look through. There's so much information that about where you can. If they give you a transcript <coughs> of credits that you earn, and then you would have to look if they're directly transferable, like to um, Berk, uh, Penn, Penn State, Penn State yes. Park. They were directly transferable there. Um, and then if they decided to stay for a four year, they could stay at Penn State and then transfer to the main campus. So that was, but you'd have to read. There, there are so many different schools that are involved in this. There are. In that, in that brochure, they do, it does say, they have articulation agreements with, say, um, <coughs> like Stevens Trade School or Lincoln Technical Institute or uh, PTI here, you know, besides the colleges. Uh, and when you look through, when you look through that pamphlet, it actually by by course it actually tells you wh which ones they have in place, articulation agreements, or are pending. So it's just listed in there. Okay. And if you want to look through the book, I can hand it to you right now. There's a lot, a lot of information in their sure. in their catalog. Okay. More than what I can talk about. Thank you. This time. <coughs> <coughs> we invite you back next month when Dr. Lees is here. That would probably you could probably learn a little bit more from him as he's the, the person that's been in charge of that program for a number yeah. of years. Sounds good, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the public or comments? Okay. Good questions, good discussion. Thank you guys. Uh, moving on to buildings and grounds. Uh, we have a facility committee report. Okay. This was the first meeting for the new board new board members, which was Sam. Mr. McLaughlin and, and Mr. Wolf. Uh, we did discuss uh, under sequence here as far as the boiler installations, which are uh, wall pack boilers at the high school. Uh, Mr. Smith installed those with some minor outside help. Uh, Mr. Smith did a great job. He needs a uh, pat in the back once again. He saved the district about 110000 uh, He did that repair for 30000 That was a total of around 140 going out for a contractor. Uh, we did fall into, as far as other items, as far as the middle school roof repairs, uh, there is a little uh, cut in the seam at, around the student store. Uh, there is a temporary repair. It uh, gets a little nicer out. Uh, Mr. Smith will be handling that. Uh, the downspouts uh, at the middle school that's outside, they are addressing that issue. Security at the stadium, we're still working with that. Uh, Mr. Wolf had a very nice presentation uh, researching that with his background with the cameras and security. And uh, Mr. Smith is looking at those avenues. The annex bleachers, uh, we do have issues at the high school, or excuse me, the annex, which is the old high school. Jim, uh, the boards are breaking apart, they're cracking. He did some temporary repairs to the framework. The board did uh, come to the conclusion that uh, an agreement that we would close those bleachers. They're not being used other than for <coughs> outside basketball games. So right now they're shut down. Uh, the We are so looking at as far as the, the vehicles for the district. Uh, we're trying to come up with some kind of cost to be able to track the maintenance. So our next meeting will be addressing that in March uh, to come up with some kind of cost. Uh, but we are also, we did look at that evening uh, through uh, for my Franklin cleaning equipment with the IntelliBot, which we're trying to, uh, every night obviously the, the custodial staff has to either mop and clean the floors. Right now they do it with a mobile scrub manual scrubber. Uh, this IntelliBot does basically tracks, uh, it's a program tracking system with sonar. Uh, the I gave the board members today a email stating all the uh, information that we have on that cost on that unit, and we had quite a long discussion on that as far as we're looking around thirty-two to $33,000. Uh, we're figuring probably a two-year payback if we would uh, have curtailment at the high school as far as uh, through attrition uh, we could uh, replace it with this machine. Uh, 
Uh, obviously, uh, the, the cost we have down here is $27,650. Uh, there are additional costs. They do throw in uh, the extra battery pack. The total cost of ownership, obviously, you put all that stuff together, it comes up to that thirty-two to thirty-three thousand, uh, and that's what we addressed. That there are several other schools. We did have a demonstration uh, with it. Like I said, there still needs to be an individual to mop the floors prior to using this because it, it just scrubs. It doesn't collect any of the debris. Uh, after it, it tracks a section of the school, it can it sets a pager off for the staff. That either it can continue or it can shut down. So it, it basically could grid the whole school and clean itself as far as the halls. There was also some, um, for the benefit of the public, if you wanted to look a little bit closer at this, um, the Governor Mifflin School District was also looking at this. And in last Monday's Reading Eagle, <laughs> there was actually a story on it. And Mr. Smith yeah. was saying they're stealing our thunder. But uh, a lot of schools are starting to take a look at this, and that's what we were doing last Monday night. So this is this is something obviously we're gonna we're gonna continue to review. Obviously, look at this budget process uh, and and see what we can do with that. Uh, obviously, I think one if we look at the budget with Mr. Smith right now, knock on wood, the, the heating has been a, a great savings. So this might be an avenue where we could maybe pull some of those funds uh, with that. The as far as we are basically under review. Uh, feasibility study as far as looking at our buildings and see if any, there's any potential out there for possibly closing one of the buildings. Uh, right now this is in very early stages. I hope nobody jumps up and is very concerned because, like I said, this is very early stages. I believe we're looking anywhere from a 16 to 18 month window. If that could even well, if I can, happen. we're looking around the district. We're noticing that there are some empty classrooms at the elementary level. Uh, and it just kind of throws up a little bit of a red flag. Uh, we're also looking at, obviously, in terms of uh, budgetary issues, um, the lease that we have here uh, goes another year and a half. So the way I would sum up what Mr. Potts is saying is we're kind of looking at the potential of consolidating the use of our space in a more cost-efficient way. And at this point, I think it's only fair to the public to do that, fair to the board. Uh, that we as the administration take on that process of coming back and saying this is what we can do, this is what we think we can do, this is what we can't do. So we're, we're um, in, the, in the very, very early stages of that process. The other avenue that we did talk about at the middle school, the auditorium sound digital processor did fail, uh, was a major failure. That cost was $4,500. I'd like to put on the, the, the voting meeting that we take that expense out of a capital expense for that $4,500, uh, put that out there. Uh, and obviously we are looking into right now the, uh, the escrow for the, the projects uh, to see if we can get those funds back at around a 135 uh, and 177, 178. That was the stadium and the parking. Uh, we have 18 months that we had to have escrow according to a contract okay. from the date of completion. So Mr. Smith and I will be working on trying to get those funds back. That's probably not going to be until next fiscal year, though. No, from the 18 months. That. The, that's, uh, that's escrow with interest rate. Correct. Whatever that amount is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right now, our, our total capital funds availability are 1.394. Uh, and, and, uh, 444 round it off. But that includes yeah. the $900,000 <laughs> that was from leftover project right. funds, which which are now available for discussion. discussion. Right. Which also we, we need to look five years out. We do have concerns with the high school roof. So I know there's an issue with the seams and the parting seams where the, the poly ISO and the tin, corrugated tin, they actually line the seams up. So right now, Mr. Smith is going to try to repair that, and at that point, it's going to be five years out. That'll be expired. For is this the, high, the new high school building or the new high school attic? Okay. Thank you. Uh, just dovetailing on the capital reserve performance, that is something that the finance committee is going to also take up right. and work with Mr. Smith and, and the facilities committee on uh, to put together a reserve pro forma. 
uh, and try to anticipate what the big um, capital expense projects are going to be coming forward over the next five to ten years and figure out, well, how much money do we have available to pay for these things? How much money do we need putting aside every year to take care of it when the event does hit? And, um, you know, how are we going to fund this? And so that hopefully will allow this board a little bit more fruitful discussion when it comes to that $900,000 in terms of can we use it for, you know, paying part of the debt payment this year, or does it go towards, you know, capital reserves um, for the projects that are coming forward? One of the things that Mr. Smith actually called me today, he's working on putting together some of those costs. Some of the things that had come up were um, the high school boilers and the cooling tower. Um, there's an estimate of about a million dollars in, in uh, expenses there in replacing those. Uh, the BEC roof, the BEC chiller. Um, what else did he have? The chiller, the, he's actually going, trains coming in, and they're going to have a right. uh, review on that. Part. The annex kitchen with another like $750,000. So there's a bunch of different things that he's got on his, his to-dos that are coming up. And I'm not saying next year, but over the next five to seven, eight have years. We have seven hundred dollars in our kitchen fund. We do have a kitchen equipment fund, if I'm not mistaken, that we can pull money out of pizza ovens and some stuff in the past. So. Yeah, we need to... We need to put together. I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of them. There is money. There. I mean, you have a, a food service fund, right. but there's not seven hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> no, sorry. We've got pizza ovens and things like you know, ovens and dishwashers and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think the general the general tone of the conversation here is that we're going to put together a list of what all those potential costs are. We'll try to estimate as to when those costs will come due, and then figure out what the what the um, resources are available to pay for those, and then start budgeting for those uh, replacements. As, as long as I've been on the board, we put money into the fund, into the budget initially to put in the capital. That's one of the first things we either cut or we don't even bother putting it in anymore because we know it's going to go away. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that have happened, though, in the past, too, is when we've ever had um, an excess in fund in funds at the end of the year, um, and we've had more money in the fund balance than we're legally allowed, that money's rolled over into capital funds, and it's been used to fund the capital reserves over time. So, um, I don't, obviously, we haven't had that issue uh, very frequently, but, um, you know, we had that issue again this past year, so. Um. And I guess our, my last item is, obviously, we did... As always, look at overtime. Our overtime right now is around six thousand dollars. We budgeted fifteen. So hopefully, uh, no snow. No snow. Yeah, snow <laughs> That's the name. zero. So, not okay. over. Questions from board members. Okay. Any questions from the public on facilities? All right. Seeing none, we'll move on to finance. There's some course approvals. Yeah, we have the, yep, we have the your budget transfers are attached. Um, Mrs. Penza, would you like to discuss C and D briefly? Uh, I don't do D. That's I don't know. That comes from the BCIU. Well, that's our normal approval. So I don't know what that. I know there's always two votes, but Mrs. Nyman only just to describe why there's two different votes. votes. Right. Right. So that's that's our share and, and all the information there. So you might just explain for the benefit of the new board members item C. Well, it's just um, you're approving for us to uh, go out for private our private bids for the art general supplies, computer, custodial, and athletic for the 12-13 school year. And as part of D here, I mean, there's two votes. So one, you vote as an individual board member on whether or not you approve the BCIU budget, and then we vote as a board as to whether or not we approve the BCIU budget. So if you have a, a personal issue with it and, and you want to lodge a, a protest vote, I guess that's the time to do it. There uh, could be a dissenting vote, but still passes for the, the entire vote. Um, and moving on, the Finance Committee report. Uh, tonight we discussed a couple of different things. Uh, briefly, uh, we discussed uh, the real estate installment option, real estate tax installment option, uh, the government... Uh, Pennsylvania uh, legislature passed um, some regulations that said that we have to offer uh, an installment option to small businesses, but they didn't define what a small business was and left that up to the school districts. So it was recommended by administration that all taxpayers have the option to make installment payments. The Finance Committee uh, concurred with that, and so... Um, Are we going to define what the installment is? Same as tax, same as now. Same as this, it's three, three, now. three installments. Okay, that, that's a flat, flat rate. Will be defined flat rate. Resolution. Okay, that, that's why I wanted to make sure it was defined. That we just same as it is now for taxpayers. Okay. So it'll come forward in a resolution from the administration to the board, and then we'll vote on it. Okay. 
Um, we also discussed lunch, lunch prices. Um, the state requires there has to be more uh, in correlation between what we charge versus what we get reimbursed. And um, currently, we charge considerably less than what we get reimbursed by the state. So we're charging a dollar ninety-five for lunch. The state reimburses us two point seven seven, two dollars and seventy-seven cents. So we are undercharging for our lunches. That's at the elementary level. At the elementary level. So we need to raise the prices and get them current with the reimbursement rate. So um, after some discussion, we we had asked the administration to come back to us with a five-year plan assuming, looking at past history, that the reimbursement rate has increased at about a nickel a year over the last couple of years. And so if you take that assumption going forward, what do we need to raise our rates over the next five years to catch up to the reimbursement rate? And then we'll have a plan that we can bring forward to the board um, for its approval. Okay? Uh, accounts payable. Um, this is a um, uh, Commerce Bank approached... Uh, our administrative offices here with an option for generating revenue from the payment of our bills. So essentially what they do is um, they set up a system that allows us to um, wire our transactions through Visa to our creditors and um, and where Visa charges a, a fee, 2% or some number, to the creditors to get that guaranteed payment. Um, and what happens then is uh, Commerce Bank then turns around and takes a piece of that fee, that 2%, and gives it back to the school district. They assumed it was 1.2% of the two, and um, which, based on our last year's expenditures and payments, uh, would generate about $20,000 worth of income for the school district, simply by paying our bills. Now, do we also then pay net free or something, get any other benefit from our tax, from our vendors at all? You're talking about if we paid early? Right. I think this is just set up at the, at the regular time that they're due and but payable. Is there an opportunity that we can Well, I'd imagine if our vendors offer a discount right. for paying early, we should be taking advantage of, of that. Are paying, uh, giving you a discount for paying electronically. Yeah, I mean, no matter how we pay for it, I would hope to. I haven't seen that, but we do get bills, I know, especially with Ken, Mr. Yeah. Smith's maintenance stuff, and whenever we can take the net the discount. 10 or whatever, we take that, it. So a lot, lot of them are, are giving you additional discount for electronically because cash is king right now? Yep. And if you can get cash in their hands quickly, electronically gets them a couple days faster than a check that then has to be processed. So yep. you, do, you do the same thing. It's net 30 is our normal terms, but 5% is net 10. Yeah. yeah, so we should be taking advantage of that. What we asked um, uh, Ms. Penza to do is get the contract that Commerce Banks uses with the school districts, mm -hmm. and then we'll um, have um, Mr. Subers take a look at that. And then if he's got any input on it, um, he can get back to us, copy the board on his feedback on that. And if it looks like it's something that's doable, then we'll bring it forward to the board as a recommendation um, going forward. Okay? And that was pretty much what we discussed. We started getting into the budget. There were a couple of things that popped up in there that caught our attention regarding access and summer school and, and things of that nature that we're going to delve into a little bit more. Uh, we didn't get a whole lot of time uh, to wade too far into it, so hopefully we'll have another finance committee meeting shortly where we can get a little bit farther into the weeds on the budget and get back to you guys with some thoughts on that. Update on something. Okay, and you have an update? Yes, uh, just for the benefit oh, of... Oh, we should also... I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. Uh, why don't you speak to the governor's report just briefly? I don't think you need to go into all the details, but I think that the net-net is how much do we get versus what we were planning on budgeting, and with a caveat. Yeah. Okay. But I think it's for the benefit of the public here. Everybody needs to sort of hear big where buts. we are. Uh, there's big buts, yes. Um, what is in the preliminary budget? Um, do you want me to do a nut as the nut or the different components? <laughs> uh, no, I just throw it all out there. One big number. Because it okay. the components up different right. That are different. Right. All right. So how much money do we anticipate getting? The big nut in the 12-13 preliminary budget is $10 million. $250,434. What the governor came out with for Daniel Boone, which I will tell you the caveats in a moment, $10,296,109, which is an overall increase of $45,000 uh, and change from what we currently have in the 12-13 preliminary budget. However, of the components that this is made up of, it's no longer your basic education funding that the governor used to put out there. Um, he has now incorporated uh, our transportation subsidy and our Social Security reimbursement within 
that nut. Those items used to be reimbursed and subsidized to the district based off of actual salaries, actual costs of transportation. The understanding now for 12-13 going forward, that is no longer going to be based off of a formula. He's just giving districts an allocation. So if your salaries are increasing and your Social Security reimbursement is increasing, you may not be getting that additional funding as we had in the past, just like transportation. So we're getting a, a, a set dollar amount and our costs could still be going up higher than we anticipated. So it won't be as much money as maybe we would have gotten under the old formula. And I it may result in an ultimate loss. And right. I hesitate, um, as I emailed the board and told them that I hesitate to increase the budget by that 45000 because the numbers that the governor is giving us, we yet have been able to determine through our professional organizations where he came up with those numbers. Um, our understanding is that once all the 11-12 numbers are in, that's the number that he's going to look at prorating across the districts, but those numbers aren't going to be in until August. July, August, September. So there's no guarantee that our transportation and what he gives us is going to be close. It could be. A it may not cover our expenses. Well, it's it's one big lump sum number. Right, right. right. So, so well, you can allocate it however you want, out. but breaking it out. If you want to look at it like we have in the past, that is correct. Basic Ed has been flat funded if you look at the, the components. So special, ed. special Ed as well, but that's not in this block right. yet. That's separate. The Social Security right now is about 80000 more than what I have in the preliminary budget, and that's the consensus from all the other business managers across the state. Everybody was emailing in, my, what I have is a lot less. Well, that's just because he's just flat funded, like throwing a number out there right now. It's not based off of anything. So... More to, more to come. We do have another webcast on the 24th um, through our organization to maybe learn a little bit more. Every day there's some new development that comes out with it. So, Well, at the bottom line, I think what it, the, the gist of it is, is they're going to write you a check, and that's yeah. And it, it may not be correlate to what your true expenses are, so you're going to have to you know, figure out how you, you bring your expenses down to meet what the state is doling out. No, it might go out. And I think there is uh, legislation that would have to change. It's the best you got to go, to go off of. Through. The school code would have to change for some of this. So there's more than just approving the budget. I think there's legislation that would need to be voted on it. Okay. Any questions for uh, Ms. Penza on that? Okay. Did you want to add yes. something? Yes. Um, as you are all aware, on the board end, for those of you in the public that are following, we uh, submitted to the Department of Education last month uh, a number of potential alterations slash curtailments to program. Uh, I've been in touch with the Department of Education. We should know before the end of the month what their decision is on those, and as soon as I get that notification, I will certainly let the board know uh, what has happened with each of those individual applications. Okay. Any other questions? No, i, I got to bring something up and maybe a little bit out, but we've got a ton of kids here that probably need kids in school. And something brought to these my kids. I know Mrs. Hamill understood also that with the budget that came in last year, we have a potential safety issue out there with some of our athletics. Um, and we may need to look to fund an extra coach, at least in this year's budget, if not next year's budget, in cross country. Um, one coach for 40 kids or 35 kids. Um, safety issue on top of a number of other things. And, um, I don't know how we're going to go about doing it. We need to look at some of this a little closer because uh, uh, there was an incident which they'll probably speak to where a student had to go to the hospital and the coach left to take the kid to the hospital and there's nobody there to coach the kids. Um, I don't know if you've seen some of these emails floating around. But, uh, uh, you may want to go back and reevaluate uh, at least Goose needs to probably reevaluate our, our coaching and our staffing from that standpoint. I mean, it's obviously not a Title IX issue, but it is a, a safety issue for our students. Yeah, well, I mean, um, obviously this is the first I've ever heard of it. Okay. So, I mean, I think... I know I've heard of it. I know, I know Mrs. Hamill's heard of it. Um, and I don't know if anybody... And, and Mr. Uh, McCall's heard of it. So, I mean, it, it's come to our attention, uh, maybe selectively through people that we know that, that are out there. So, yeah. Um, well, look, the health, the health the safety, again. welfare of the kids obviously comes first, right. in my opinion. So... Um, at the end of the day, I think, one, the administration needs to jump on that issue and figure out how you're staffing these things. So if something like that happens, 
is there another volunteer around? Is there another faculty, somebody around to, to make sure the kids have some sort of supervision? And, and we'll have to leave it to the athletic facilitator to come back to us with some sort of explanation mm -hmm. as to what's going on. Well, Maybe what happened was Mr. Legat when he made his cuts last year, mm -hmm. uh, when knowing that Mr. McComsey was retiring, took his number, number out of the, the budget uh, without replacing. So we have one cross-country coach mm -hmm. uh, where there were two. I mean, it would be a part of the normal budget deliberations. I mean, I don't think you have time. I think it's really no, we don't have cross countries coming up. This we need this another year, coach this year. year. Or we have a safety issue. Can we have that for the voting? Cross countries in the fall. <coughs> or, or cross countries in the fall. Coming up in the fall. Okay. So we have time to discuss that. Training during the summer. Right. Okay, so well, look, obviously it needs to be addressed. And, and so I think we need, one, give the administration some time to come back with a plan to address it. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, the athletic facilitator is prepared to talk about mm -hmm. that, maybe with the board at the voting meeting in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. And then we'll have... I, I would just say they had something happen to us get because they weren't properly being supervised. And then we got all other kinds of issues we have to work on. Uh, look, I, I'm not in disagreement with you. So, it, you know, I think it's a question of how is the athletic facilitator going to handle that situation. So, uh, you know, I'd like to hear what, what the administration has in terms of a solution. If the solution is, hey, look, you got to hire somebody... And you got to hire somebody. If the solution is well, no, we're going to cover it through some other means. I, I don't know what the answer is. So um, I think it's important to have that discussion. Can we get the athletic facilitator to come to the next meeting? Just That's what I just said. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, at the and, voting And, and honestly, the only reason I brought it up here versus probably under a new business is it's 930, and we think we've got a bunch of the high school kids that probably need to get out and get back to home so they can get to class. So and it is a budget issue, so that's why I brought up on the so. Not a problem. Okay. Any uh, public comment on finance? Each team and they play at different times. 
think about basketball. Boys, girls, varsity, JV, middle school, subject, and free. Six different busing requirements for the end game at different times. Cross country has seven meets, two or three at home. We need busing for counties, districts, states, and two invitationals. This means we need a large bus approximately six times a year and land three times. Our transportation costs are nowhere near the schools. Financially, the cost of two coaches would be approximately the same amount that Mr. McCompson was paid. Okay. The difference is small due to the seniority that Mr. McCompson has. Cross country is an inexpensive sport for the school. We require no supplies except that one or two meets a year we require to see officiating. This expense is also shared with middle school. We supply our own equipment, that is, running shoes and warm ups, and believe that our sports be adequately covered for the patrons. Both girls and boys teams should have the same opportunity to accept. We have an amazing program. Our girls are second in the town. And we had two boys represent our school in the We had four girls and two boys represent our school as members of the all division cross country team this year. Given proper opportunities and more instruction from two coaches, both teams could represent the school with even greater success. In light of the district's financial situation last year, we thought it prudent to see if the cross country teams could function with one coach. We quickly realized that it could not. Cross country is an inexpensive sport, and two high school coaches' salaries should adequately be covered by our activity pay. We request that the safety of our children be the priority and that a paid assistant or head coach be added to our roster. We have four amazing teams comprised of scholar athletes who are in the five to end the team. With the proper support, the varsity girls and boys have the potential to go far in the state this year. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for providing us with this information. Excuse okay. me, can I ask one more question? Do you have a volunteer? We have a few volunteers. Okay, were they at every meet? I mean, do you get them to go to every meet? They can't always attend every meet. Okay, so on the average, at how many meets do you have? With no volunteers, just a coach? Oh, well. Just a ballpark. If you want to consider parents volunteers who were. No, 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 I'm sorry. Approved by the district as volunteers. We have one. one. There was one. one. Okay, but were they there at every meet? No. Okay, that, that's my question. Thank you. I, and I just want to make sure that benefit of the public, everyone understands, the activity fee isn't to um, subsidize any individual sport. The activity fees that have been implemented are across all district activities. So everyone pays a fee to participate in a sport or to participate in a club. And those fees go to help subsidize the entire athletic slash band slash uh, club um, expense. expense. <laughs> we have about five hundred and eighty thousand dollars worth of expenses in that realm. The activity fees, the gate receipts, the physical fees—all those things only bring only support about two hundred thousand dollars out of that budget. So the other three hundred thousand dollars comes out of the other the rest of our operating funds, and of course. That's where we have a problem in the school district. We don't have enough money to pay our bills and to pro provide all the programming that we once had in the past. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that, whether it's cross-country or some other activity, you know, on a, on a per-student basis, the activity fee may support your particular program, but remember there's other programs where the fees don't even come close to supporting um, that particular uh, activity or program. So it's, it's an overall subsidy to all things, all right? Please go ahead. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, my question was a Title IX issue uh, with uh, this being the only sport that has a boy and girl varsity team and you only have one coach. All of your other girls' teams have a coach or at least an assistant coach that is assigned. Um, so my question is, who's looking at Title IX? Our solicitor is looking at Title IX. And has that been answered yet? No, it has not. It's under review. It's, we got an email on that today. Yeah, but it's. I don't think that email is definitive, and we haven't had an opportunity to, to talk to him about what his conclusions were. So he did get us. He did send us a letter regarding the Title IX issue, not only with cross country, but a Title IX issue was brought up regarding the middle school softball girls, girls softball team. And so we instructed our solicitor to look into both issues. He has done a preliminary uh, uh, investigation into those issues. He did send us a letter, but in my opinion, the letter was kind of incom inconclusive as to whether or not there's truly a violation or not a violation in terms of Title IX. And that's certainly something we need to discuss with him as a board. And the next opportunity to do that is at the voting meeting, and we probably have to do that in an executive session 
you know, either before or after the voting meeting, so we understand what the legal ramifications are of our current situation vis-a-vis -vis the state law, and then we can decide as a board how we're going to address that going forward. Okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, look, if it's a Title IX violation, we have to be in compliance. I mean, that, you know, that's that's what the issue is. I guess the question is, is it a violation, is it not a violation? And, you know, putting that aside, obviously, you know, you heard us express that we're, we're concerned, obviously, with the health, safety, welfare of our kids first and foremost. I mean, that's I that's our job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and just one more point about uh, cross country. I know uh, I work in another school district. It always seems to be one of the first sports put on the table to be cut. Um, my son Luke has been offered at least eight thousand dollars in college scholarships because of cross country and track and field. Um, so it is not a sport that is worth cutting. I don't know if any of your other athletes, I mean, some fantastic athletes in the room, have had that degree of scholarship money offered to him, and he is being heavily recruited by LaSalle and uh, uh, Bucknell and. Um, it's just been amazing from our coaches and the, um, uh, the exposure we've gotten in Berks County. Um, and I thank the board. For, I thank the board for keeping it last year. Um, I know districts are facing major battles, and what sports are going to look like five years from now is going to be a big question. Um, but um, cross country has served him. He was a basketball player for quite a few years and left basketball to be back in the field and cross country. And he's been outstanding and a great representative for this district. Thank you. Aaron Durso, 427 Silverbrook Drive. Just to address the issue of volunteer coaching, I've been in the path of volunteer coach. And that poses a problem with certain school districts where they want a real coach to walk them through the course when they come to our school. And sometimes they make an issue with the PIAA official. If you're not a coach or the assistant coach, they do not want you walking them through the course. So we've, we've come up with those problems in the past as an assist, as a volunteer coach. There's a certain, few certain school districts that give us a hard time. When, uh, we're not allowed to participate in coaches' meetings at, at an event, at a bigger invitation only of coaches' meetings. If the coach is out jogging the kids through the course, which is very important, and as a volunteer, you show up, um, sometimes they don't hand you the information because you're not the coach or the assistant coach. And so, just so you guys understand, it does create some logistical issues with some of the schools in the county and some of the bigger invitations that we go to that volunteer coaches um, don't get offered the stuff and then the coaches wind up and then having to really run fast to get everything coordinated with the kids. So just so you know, even if we had the volunteers, which you know we've done in the past and a lot of parents that do that, we're not able to certify the team, we're not able to go in and register the team at the big meets. And, and some school districts within our county do snub and say, if you're not an assistant coach or the head coach, we don't want you to walk us through, through your course. So you have to understand that there are some of those issues as well that are um, on the back burner for only having one coach. So just wanted you to understand that. Okay. Thank you for bringing that to our attention.
dollars, they're not getting what other sports are getting. So I think everyone realizes the hundred and fifty dollar goes for the overall program. But when they see the football gets five coaches, <coughs> and, uh, the track and field only gets one, you can understand why parents are upset. Um, my second thing I wanted to bring up was the, the lunches. I don't understand. We outsource the lunches. Um, well, we have, a, we have a Sodexo right. is a company that provides food services for the school district. So we're going to increase our lunches? We, the school district sets lunch fee prices, and currently we're setting that price at $1.95. For elementary school, yeah, thank you. And the state provides some reimbursement for school lunches, and the state re provides that reimbursement right now at a rate of two dollars and seventy-seven cents for, 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 for the free and reduced lunch. lunch. So what happens is somebody who's on a free and reduced lunch program, you have kid A that's on free and reduced lunch, we get two dollars and seventy-seven cents back from the school district for providing that student with a lunch that we're only charging a dollar ninety-five for. So. Oh, to other students, right. So you see the inequity. So what happens then is the state is literally subsidizing the paying students' lunch as well. And so the state has said you can't charge students at a rate less than what we're reimbursing you for. So we need to raise the rates. So we raise the rates. to get money back from a handful of others that are getting it's a law. It's the Healthy it's the law. Kids Hunger Act law. Right, you're a legislator. We take less of the state reimbursement. No. We don't have yeah. that option. The reimbursement for a free meal is what it is, and what so the set. law is telling us is they don't want that okay. to subsidize. So because students. the state gives us whatever, we need to now charge everybody else that same rate. At least that guess. much, yes. At least. So our elementary kids are going to be spending well, $2.77. Not, not, not off the start. What we're going to do is we're going to start slowly increasing the rates at, at a, at a, over a period of years to catch up to whatever the state uh, current rate is. Why are we outsourcing our lunches? So we used to always make our own lunches. I believe we're one of the only school districts that are outsourcing in our area. We've had somebody as long as I've been on the board seven, eight years now. I graduated. Well, that way, that's okay. A lot of school districts ran their own lunch programs. This is stuff they're doing. That's right. But I mean, if we're going to be raising it, this doesn't have anything to do with uh, the management company of our cafeterias, really. This is a state law that we're required. I think it's federal, actually. Or federal law. We don't make any money. In fact, we don't lose money. No. 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 What they're saying is, if a child is on a free and reduced lunch program, the state pays us, sorry, federal, two dollars and seventy-seven cents. We're only charging for other students a dollar seventy. Dollar ninety five. They're saying that you have to bring that up eventually in the ballpark of what they're paying. Within five years. Is it two seventeen or two seven? Two dollars and seventy seven cents. Correct. So we're not going to increase it all in one shot. When Mr. Basil suggesting over five years, slowly increase that in the elementary school to eventually get to where the free and reduced reimbursement is. So we may have to raise lunch rates twenty five cents a year over the next five years to get it up to a rate that's the same as the reimbursement rate. We're not being given raise next year. Well, well, what percentage you oh, hold it. Well, well, I, that's but one at a time. One at a time. So, For revenue enhancement, why shouldn't the school district look into if we're going to be charging $2.77? We're not charging it. We will be. No, that's what the state pays. Maybe in five years, whatever five the state years. rate is, be it'll be probably more than that. The state may be charging at that point $3 a lunch. So we will be eventually charging our students $3 yes. a lunch. Yes. And we'll be going to this other company. Yeah. No, it has, no, it has no. nothing to do with the company. So whether we do it all in-house or we hire somebody to manage our employees, which is what happens here, um, the state or the federal government requires that we charge our students the same rate that they are reimbursing us at for free and reduced lunch. I don't I don't know how else to explain it to I you. Hear you. I hear you. No, here across the country, Sodexo 
where we'd be doing ourselves. The house of Dexel is being paid, if I'm not, because I can do a lot of these companies, is they're getting their, their, their supplies, their food, at a much cheaper rate than we can get it because of their buying power. They're, they're the big organization that they are. And they then are able to prepare the food Apples and, and sell it at the rate to do it. Apples and oranges. It, it's, well, again, yeah, let me just explain it so yeah. he... So that, you know, if we pull so Dexo out of the mix, at the end our cost is going to be the, relatively the same because the money that we're paying them, we're going to pay to buy these groceries to make these meals. We're still maintaining the same employees because we're paying them. We're just managing them. And at the end, it's net, net the same, but we wouldn't be doing it. Or higher. Or, 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 or higher. Our cost could be higher. If they can do it for $1.90 now, no, it's not it has nothing to do with that. You, with that. I think you're... It says that for everybody who gets a free or reduced lunch, we're going to give you $2.70. Okay? Therefore, to get that $2.70, you need to charge your existing students $2.70. If you don't charge your existing, you don't have a choice. Okay, we're going to give you 270. You need to bring your other price up to 270, or you're in violation of that agreement that free What they're saying is, why should the federal government pay 277 for a free or reduced by but an ordinary child who's not in the program pay a dollar ninety five? But that 270 is set all over. It's just that all over the country. All over the country. That's where they come up with 277. Our food prices here could be different than in Great Valley or you know, Twin Valley or California or Redding or wherever. Everybody has their own lunch prices. Whatever the reimbursement rate is for 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 us, that's what we got to charge out for the other students. I don't know how else to answer it. It's going into our budget. So what will be going into the school budget? Sure. Coming into the school's income. Yeah, it's coming into school's income. It's not going to school. My question is correct. It's not going to school. No, it's the district's money. They get a fixed fee to maintain that period. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank I think you'd have to get the athletic facilitator out here to describe her budget okay. and and what what she's spending money on. Thank you. Just for what it's worth, Jeannie Barris, again, 2234 East Main Street. Um, we, um, my son is a uh, lacrosse player, um, and I just wanted to be known that our program is completely and totally self-sufficient. Yes, we we, we do fund ourselves. We're aware of that and, one. Um, Yep. Thank you, right. sir. Did you have a comment? I didn't mean to cut you off, but we all everybody has to come up to the stadium one at a time, state your name, and. What's the percentage of students in the elementary level that receive a free reduced lunch? I mean, I don't have that information off the top of my head. I believe it's trainer It ranges in one building from approximately ten percent to another building that's thirty-five percent. So, well, it's right. higher this year than it was last year. 16 point something percent. So almost 80% of students and parents will have to pay higher lunches for 16 I, said, I, I understand the federal. That's one of those mandates. Talk, we, talk to Jim Garrelock. Yeah, talk to your, yeah. your federal okay. representative. Okay, any other public comment? Yeah, well, we want to give everybody a chance, so. I am just rebutting what um, Mr. Conkle said. As far as the boys and the football team and our hats and our shirts and everything, that comes from fundraising that we were made to sell cards, and they had to do it, and that's how they earned it, plus the golf they have that because the dolls had had every year. So it didn't come from the school. It came from the kids and the kids. Okay, thank you. I would also like to add to that that I know Mr. Badola spends a lot of his time volunteering to print up those T-shirts and make sure that the kids get them. Um, this is about finance, right? This is about the money. Which we just about. Okay. All right. Well. <laughs> I just don't want to, I just want to be, there's going to be time at the end of the meeting, we can talk about whatever we want, but we also got to get through the meeting too, so. I guess my question is, I 
I was here when you first discussed under finance about raising the rates. You said you're not in compliance right now. That's correct. And if I'm understanding correctly, you want to incrementally do it yes. to get to that. So then would that mean next year you're not in compliance? Next year you're not correct. in compliance? Correct. We have five, five years. years to get in My point is, if there's no penalty, what's the problem? So the question is, is there a penalty? If there's no penalty, then don't worry about it. Is my, that's my question. Maybe we don't have the answer now, but that's my question. I, Ms. Penza here, you didn't hear, but you were saying we have five years? My understanding we are is that there's five for... years that we have to be in compliance by that. So, you don't, so, so you're you're not That's why we were going to do it incrementally okay. rather than one big... So right now, you're not out of compliance. That technically, you're right. They're giving us five years to get there. Correct. But, but you want to wait to the fifth year and then raise the right dollar. No. no, it's not. No. Okay. What happens if you say no? What happens if you say no? I, you're, you're in violation of the federal law, and they could defund you. They will fund you. Okay. Yeah, that, that's that's cool. generally their penalty. Well, yeah. They take okay. money from you. Moving on to personnel. Um, just that that list of uh, names turn an air conditioner on in here. will will grow um, as as needed. Um, I have nothing to point out unless there are any questions to be asked. Okay. Anybody have any questions from the board on personnel? Any comment from the public on personnel? Okay, moving on to programs. Again, uh, the only item that I would, the routine approval of that trip, obviously funded uh, and paid for by students, um, needs your approval as it's um, out of state. Um, the item C uh, vote on was... That. was um, reviewed by Mr. Shaheen in his report. So at, at some point, I would assume toward the end of the meeting, we would. Well, I don't, we could do it right now. Maybe this is a voting what the meeting. Protocol is. I would. Why would close the create a hole? I'll make a motion to close. And then do you want to close it, or do you just want to temporarily close the meeting? Well, can, can we just wait till the end at the adjournment? Then we'll why? I don't know why you just don't do a voting meeting at the end. Well, well this is published as a voting meeting. Yeah, I know, but I'm saying it's easier and then. Whatever. But do we need to close the committee? I don't think we have to come to close it. No, I don't think we have to because this is a voting meeting. Vote on That's right. It advertises to a voting sure. meeting. I would prefer to make a motion for temporary closing. You make a motion for 10C? Yeah, 10C. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. No, I'm sorry, who seconded uh, Mr. Wolf. Or Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Okay. Okay. Any discussion by the board? All right. Mr. Seminero. Yes. Mrs. Hamill. Yes. Mr. Kurtz. Yes. Mr. McCullough. Yes. Mr. McLaughlin. Yes. Mr. Potts. Yes. Mr. Shaheen. Yes. Mr. Wolf. Yes. Mr. Bailey. Yes. Motion passed. Okay. All right. Any other comment from board members on programs? Any comment from the public on programs? Okay. On to policy. We've got several. Um, well, we have. Do you want me to start? I'll start. Yeah, go ahead. Some second readings that um, have already been uh, vetted by uh, the necessary parties. Um, I don't want to steal. I'm assuming Mr. Kurtz will have some thunder for us. Yes. Yeah, so I won't steal his thunder, but we're going to uh, review a number of uh, things that happened at our last policy committee, attended by Mrs. Trainer and myself from the administration and the rest of the policy committee. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Mr. Kurtz for his report. Okay. Uh, the Policy Review Committee, which was established back in December, met on Wednesday, February 8th, and at that time the administration provided us with uh, policies that were revised to include the changes that the committee requested on January 30th, which was the first time we met. Uh, I would like to thank the administration for their quick turnaround and um, the hours of typing required to update these policies. Some of them have not been updated since the 1980s. Um, moving on to... Uh, you want, I'm going to talk about some things that uh, we should be doing that but we haven't. In addition, to, uh, in addition to proposing changes to outdated policies, the committee identified some policies that were not being followed. Importantly, policy 006, the policy that governs how board meetings are run, dictates that our meetings are supposed to follow the procedures outlined in Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised, including small group rules. We have been following some, but not all, of the small group rules. There are eight small group rules, and we currently only follow six of them at our voting meetings. The rules that we do not follow state the motions do not need to be seconded, and members can discuss a subject at any time when no motions are pending. 
This is not a change in policy, only a reminder that we must either follow the policy or we must change it. Um, uh, that, that is something that we haven't been doing that we need to be in order to be in accordance with our policies. Just to state motions according to our policy <coughs> do not need to be seconded at the voting meeting, and discussion can occur whether a motion is on the floor or not. Mr. Gr then we, we can change that policy we to can. say that we will require seconds, and then discussions cannot be made, made until... I mean, it just seems like for proper decorum, it seems like a proper... And that way we get the second, we get the first, we get the second, and then we can discuss... It just seems like a closing. Well, it does. I think sometimes uh, discussion is, is sometimes inconvenient if we want to bring something up. We had that issue with the last meeting. Right. We wanted to ask a question, but there was no formal motion made. It can be very formal. Um, if that's something the board wanted to do, we could. If I just wanted to bring that to the attention, the policy current state currently states that we do not need second motions. Um, and then letter A, Dr. Otto suggested that Robert's rules be posted on BlazerNet for board access to look at them to have access to and the administration, I believe, is working on posting them. Is that correct, Dr. Ryan? That's correct. Okay. Uh, now, another issue we found, policy 007 states, which is our distribution policy, which states where copies of the policy manual are located. That policy states that copies of the board policy manual, uh, they must be kept in each library and faculty lounge. The administration has been instructed to ensure that this policy is being followed. Um, additionally, a typo correction needs to be made to proposed policy 004. Should we talk about that now, or do I talk well, about it? Well, it's a first it? reading, so, so we'll, that has time to... All right. Uh, if you want to mention it, that's fine. We'll yeah, take care of it. It says, uh, if want, I don't know if we want to flip the policy 004, but I can read. Um, it says that the policy is membership, and it says, uh, if a change to the policy review committee recommended that page 3, lines 27 to 31, we recommended they should read... Accordingly, the board shall give or give access to each new school director no later than his or her first regular meeting as a school director for his or her use to, uh, during the term on the board of the following items. Currently, the policy states that we have to give a copy of the policy manual of um, the previous budget. It states that we, we don't want to say that we will give or give access to because now that is included on Blazor now. And you do not need to have a physical copy. That is just something that wasn't included that should bring that more to the attention of the administration that should be changed. Finally, uh, I want to clarify our current policy on abstaining from votes and giving notice of a conflict of interest. Our current policy states that any board member who must abstain from voting on a motion is required to publicly announce and disclose the nature of his or her interest as a public record in a written memorandum filed with the person responsible for recording the minutes of the meeting at which the vote is taken prior to the vote being taken. So the form needs to be filled out prior to the vote being taken. Uh, Mr. Basil brought this up at the committee and... Well, sometimes, I mean, I you don't have that. access to that form prior to... I'm just saying we got to... Yeah, we have to yeah. change the policy. We'll change that, yeah. Or change the policy, we've got to change our practice. Yeah. I mean, in my opinion... Before you abstain for something that has to do with a conflict of interest, I mean, your fellow board members and the public should know. And a lot of times we often wonder when and don't know. Right, and so people should express why they're, right. I mean, that's my personal opinion, and that's what the policy says. Right. So either we've got to follow the policy, we've got to change the policy. The policy committee didn't make a recommendation to change the policy. We just want to make sure the board was aware that that's what the procedure has yeah, to be. Filling the form out after you abstained is one thing, but you should probably at least publicly announce why you abstained. Yeah, and that's I, I, okay, I have a question. Are you allowed to discuss? Are you allowed to be participating in discussion? Well, if why you're wouldn't you? Uh, I'm just asking. I could answer you why you wouldn't. Should you well, be allowed but, to okay, can we make sure that's in there then? Sure, I mean, they might, have a, they might have a reason that they can't. Yeah, they have to abstain, but they might have to have good input. So I think they should be allowed to participate, but they just, they're going to yeah, The policy say, currently doesn't state that you cannot participate. Okay, okay. So well, I'm just making sure. We can that add that in if you'd like to. I think we can bring I, up the policy. Again, if, if they're going to abstain and they're going to. Uh, again, I think if, it's a, if, if you are abstaining from the vote because you have a conflict of interest, then talking about that vote could sway other board members. Do you really think so? But if you. If you disclose that you have the conflict of interest, like, yeah. hey, you know, my brother works for XYZ company, and you guys are about ready to vote on his contract. So on that. that's my conflict of interest. Now, let me tell you all the great things about XYZ company. I mean, yeah. now you understand what the bias is, or, you know, so. What if you, what if you, again, what, I, 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 I agree with Mr. Bailey. I think you should be allowed to discuss it because 
it, you might have to abstain because as, as long as you explain your abstain why. first. Sure. Don't, don't discuss it and go through the whole thing and then at the end say I'm going to abstain. No, but yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Because <laughs> I'm going to have a problem with that. Well, then maybe it needs to be. Problem. Maybe we need to amend the policy. Yeah. It says you know you can discuss it, but you have to discuss you know you before you do anything else. You, you, have you have to disclose. I think you're loading the vote. Yeah, that shouldn't be an issue. I think we can add that in. We'll talk about that in the next meeting. Well, not necessarily. So are that. you agreeing with what's being discussed, or you have a different point well, of view? I'm, no, I'm discussing with Walt, with Mr. Sheen, that obviously your discussion could be persuading. And then you abstain uh, later on. Yeah, yeah but okay, but okay, okay, I'll pull it out there. If it has to do with teachers' this contract, I can't vote on it, but I'd like to discuss whether we do something about it. So why should I not be allowed to discuss it? I'm not saying board? you can't, as long as you announce it, oh, you okay. abstain prior to discussion. Oh, well, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. I think this kind of dovetails into that Robert's Rules of Order. Being able to discuss a motion before it's made is kind of helpful because there have been times where people are like, well, I'm going to table that motion, and we haven't even discussed it yet. You know, and so there's no reason for the table, and then it's a second, and it's a vote, right? And then nobody understands why you're tabling a motion, and there's no discussion on the motion before the board. Or somebody may want to amend what's written there, but there's no opportunity to discuss it until after the thing's already on the, on the table, and then you have to get permission to to take it back and you know so I think there's a lot of room for discussion as a board as to how we want to operate going forward whether it's the way we have been or it's the way that's currently in the policy. So I would like to say uh, Robert Rules of Order without the small group rules that is more geared towards running a an assembly with more than 12 participants. For example we have less than 12 on our board 12 voting members but we are supposed to use small group rules which has helped to facilitate ideas and a more a, a better discussion through. Well, as this is all still in first reading, this is obviously open for yeah, lots of discussion. Yeah, it's all malleable, and we can play with it and figure out if it's Okay, um, keep, keep moving along. Well, that's all I have right now for my report, other than all the policies which you received. I think you see over 50 pages. Well, I, I, did, I did discuss prior to this meeting uh, L, which is number four membership, I believe it is. Section six, which is removal. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, and I, and I looked at the, the ones that are in the county, and I also looked at, at what PSBA recommends, and actually have talked to somebody out there. They do not recommend nor condone changing this from the two. This is to remove, and very specifically, to remove a board member who refuses to attend a board meeting. It is not to remove a board member who may be absent due to business or illness or anything along that line. If you make this change, and we get a board member, and we've had them in the past, and Mrs. Nyman can tell you, as did others, that get elected and then just decide that they just don't like being a board member and will show up every fifth or sixth meeting, you've got to miss eight meetings before you can actually remove. If it's like myself, I'm traveling, Mr. Sherman Harrell traveling, Mr. Kurtz, if he goes to school, and they're absent due to legitimate reasons, then this doesn't come into play to begin with. Plus, I think we covered some of that with Skyping. Right, right. So I, I would recommend, so I don't, I and, agree I think, with Mr. and I think talking to, to Mr. Kurtz, he, he understands that, that if we change, leave it at two consecutive and change the wording for an excusable absence such as work or sickness or something, we're covered. Because, again, if you read what it says and you go into some of the others, it's a removal board member who refuses to attend the meetings. I, think the, can't. I think the rationale behind the change was the state only requires that you meet six times as a board Right. And so two of the six times is 30% of the board meetings. And so, hence, we were looking at 30% because the number of times that we meet as a board can change, but right? It's, it's, it, but the way we meet, you're talking eight times. No, but we could, the board could decide in December, this coming December, that we're not going to meet 22 times a year. We're going to meet 10. I mean, and that's why it was, it was talking about the approved meeting calendar. So... I, I think we're, I think I we're think running that into happens, we should future change issues. Policies, but I think we're going to run into problems. I mean, I, I would yeah. recommend and, and highly, highly recommend we put it back to two and identify what is an excused absence. Correct. That way, again, if you read what it's there for, it's for board members who refuse Correct. to attend meetings, not for board members who are absent Correct. from meetings due to... And if you and again, if you look at the other policies, Muhlenberg had a nice well, written one. Well, my, my concern nice was one. my concern was that the taxpayers elect us to sit on the board, right? And five people here can decide that they're going to kick somebody off. No, they, no, no. Yes, no. 
if, if, and there's been scuttlebutt about that, well, you know. And, and, and I know that's why so, this was put in, but I'm telling you that if we write the policy that states that for a reason other than sickness and employment or vacation, you're set. This very specifically says refuses to attend. Refuses yeah. school code language as well. Right. Refuse. It, it, it's school code. That's where I got it. From, right. Because I got it's it. It's a school code language. They said that is in this. For those who refuse, that's verbatim from the school code. Those who have to miss due to employment or sickness or vacation or anything along those lines. Okay, refuse. Mr. Sermonero going to San Francisco for work is not he refused. He couldn't. There's a big difference between refused and couldn't. I was in Chicago. Not that no, I, I get that. Refused. I'm just I saying couldn't. that I think the, the bar to remove a board member should be set extremely high because the taxpayers are the ones I, who I seek you. somebody. I, I disagree with I, I agree with what you're saying. I disagree with what you've done here. Correct. Okay. Because, That's legitimate. Okay. I mean, and and I, I talked to Mr. Kurtz and I again I talked to the PSPA I mean they said very specifically you word it so that somebody who has to be missing for employment, who is sick, who has school, some of us may take part to you know graduate courses that can't make every now and then, you had issues where you had to meet for employment reasons in other township, cannot take that action because you didn't refuse, you couldn't. Right. And, there's a and like I said, we changed, our, we changed our way that you can do Skyping right. or teleconferencing. So again, you really shouldn't have too much of a problem meeting. But again, again refuse is one thing. Correct. Is another I agree thing. with you. Okay. And as you said, those are school old languages. All right. So what do we do? We take that back? Uh, we'll committee. take it back to the committee and we will bring forward... Again, if you look at some of the others, some of them had written so that it was very specific that that the, the definitions were you know, sickness, employment. I mean, perfect. I mean, it takes care of almost everybody on this board when we talk employment. I will. We will bring that back okay. to the committee and we will come forward, we'll discuss it, and we'll go from there and okay. we'll bring it back to this board. I, I, again, Mr. Biz, I just think that if you do it as a third and we continue to meet twice a month, you're now talking... Somebody who refuses needs to miss eight meetings. And, you know, they get to seven. We had a guy, a previous board member some 15 years ago, that would meet, miss just the number he needed to, and then he'd show up, and then he'd go back and not show up again, and then show up just so that he, he could vote him out because he kept it. Can, can I ask one other thing, Mr. Kirk? I'm assuming we're going to get this for the permit, uh, voting meeting. Not only is some of the some of the policies don't look there were any changes. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, and can we you like just to. jot? Okay, for us slow people, you got to jot it down because I kept reading these, looking for the changes, and there were none. And not that I go, you know, I'm not saying you did anything wrong. I just wanted to make that, sure I didn't catch yeah, anything. Yeah, we did it. Is there any way to say at the top, even if it's just the one time until we vote, no changes, just so we know that we're not actually changing anything? I, think I should ask the administration. We never recommended changes, though, so there's no need for them to be. Approved That's fine. Again, again I don't mind reapproving. I just was looking last night. Yes. Okay, I'm, why am I looking I at understand. this if there's no change? I think, I think the thing was, date, though, right? we have a date yeah. last revised, or da last looked at. Okay. We've added that to these things. Okay. I think the other issue was the formatting had changed, so there may be some... Again, I just looked at a couple okay. policies weren't touched or whatever. Well, well and then there, there were new policies we altogether. Forward. I agree. That's what there I'm saying. Was, there were a few in the beginning. Like, zero, 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 zero is a new policy okay. altogether, so... I think what we need to do on top of each policy, Mark, if it's a new policy, okay. Mark, if it's coming up for review, because if we are going to bring every policy in front of this board to Mark as reviewed... Correct. Then we should just mark this is for review right. only, no changes, the changes have been made, and this is a new Quick, policy. Another suggestion, three can they be in italicized and in red? I think red would be helpful. I know I'm just they asking. Be. Well, they're PDF. Wait. I'm not sure. They're, they're PDF. Okay, yeah. then forget it. Again, okay. I'm just asking. Cause but, I mean, if it's in a Word document and you do track changes, then you can just email the Word document like out. The changes, yeah, right. And just make sure it's a read-only okay. file so other people can not edit it. So I think the administration will come back now and they will give us policies where they indicate new changes, no changes. Right. I'm just making sure I didn't miss it. All right, just, 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 no that? Changes, just, just no changes, and the rest will find in at that one. Yeah, okay. All right, uh, I think that makes sense. Sure miss it. Does anybody have any other comments on... Can you tell it's in red or not? If you can, you can put them in red. No, can L and Q what? come off the list. L and Q, right. L and Q, right. L and Q we took off earlier. Yeah. Right. Q and all I only recommend you word so that you can't get people... Well, I mean, for work purposes, I understand your concern, and, and, you know, there was a lot of discussion about this. For me, on a philosophical point of view, is the taxpayer put every one of us into these seats, and so you, your behavior has to be egregious before you should but, be but removed. Refusing, 
Well, we're neglecting. Yeah. 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 Neglecting is yeah. over. Yeah. We understand. So, we're going to bring it back. We're going to look at it. We'll come forward with another recommendation. Or if the committee wants to recommend the same thing, we'll bring it back in the board to take action. Okay. Any other comment from the board? This committee is going is going pretty well. We think we're getting a lot done. It's still going to be a long process, but it's a. We're, I think we're pretty effective so far. Okay. Any comments from the public? All right. Transportation. Um, are you guys? Do you have anything scheduled yet? Not yet. We uh, I'm waiting for Mr. Rose to get back to me. Wayne, was, uh, Mr. Klein was out of town, so we're going to get together and we'll uh, okay. the date. See if that meets everyone's approval. Okay, old business, um, any comment? No, all right. Old business, um, I just put on here a checklist of things that have been accomplished so far. If anybody has any comments on some of those things that have been completed that the board had asked or have hidden here under new business? Um, a couple of things that are still on the table uh, was someplace on the website having uh, you know all the costs that uh, related to a program so parents understand what their kids are signing up for. That was actually, actually supposed to be part of this, and we said we couldn't get it together, the, the, curric the curriculum guide, at least for the high school. Yeah. And uh, it needs to be there prior to, it should be there now. These kids are signing up for courses that have hidden costs they don't know about. Yeah. So, I, I mean, would, that's something we need to work on. I would like to say, though, for student-run clubs, I'd like a little note that maybe, for example, I, I, I have a, we have a club at the high school called Academic Challenges, like Quiz Bowl. We decided to purchase T-shirts this year, and the students brought in money and paid for it. But that would not have appeared on the website because it was something we decided to do midway through the year. And it's not repeated next year. Yes, that's correct. So are these only recurring costs? These I think this is... You and know, that's a volunteer cost as well, right? I think this is what, what really everybody no. anticipates to be the annual cost of that program. So if everybody knows that certain kids are going to go off to... I don't know, as part of a competition somewhere, and there's hotel and, you know, this, that, yeah, the other so thing I associated with it. but I just want to have something in there. The students want to spend pay, their money. Pay to physics, everybody had to pay 10 bucks. Nobody knew they had to pay 10 bucks to sign up to on, so you do your homework online. Yeah. You know, the, the, the honors 12th grade English had to buy $45 worth of books from the teacher, so everybody's reading off the same volume issue. And, I mean, those costs need to be... But my concern more is, let's just say the chess club wants to purchase something. I think that's a one-time... Well, yeah, but it needs to be... I don't want a parent coming back and saying, this wasn't included on the website, therefore you can't do it, and these kids don't get what they want, even though they all want, want to do this. So I think something should just state that in the event that a club wants to do something that isn't on this website, they have the right to do so. Well, I don't. I think that's understood. This is just a guide yeah, so people understand what the costs are. To that for, I, think I think that's a good point, mm -hmm. because that's one of the concerns that we do have about... If we, if something like just what he described happens, and it will, then you write it in the header of the of yeah. thing. All right, you put a disclaimer in. Just a little note. Just, just yeah. a it's disclaimer. A list of all, but you know, all you know of, of costs, but not limited to you know. And here's the following, and you know, it's that's what the list is. And that was uh, it. I just thought that should be something that was included. Okay. Uh, any comments from board members on old business? Comments from the public on old business? Okay. Seeing none. New business. Uh, Revenue enhancement committee. Okay. Were you gonna, I'm sorry, were you going to make a comment on old business? Uh, Matt Olson, 208 Berkshire Drive, uh, Red Snow. I'm running old business in section area, Title 9 request update. I'm going to hear what the update is. We, update. Just, we discussed this a little bit earlier in the right, meeting. I don't think he was here. But that was with cross country. It's the same issue with middle school softball. I discussed that at the when we were talking about cross country. Both items were re uh, referred to right. our solicitor. And he's going to, he provided us with a letter today. We haven't had a chance to discuss that letter with him, and we will do so in an executive session on the voting meeting at the end of the month. So the voting meeting, is that open for discussion after the voting meeting at the end? Only, we'll probably have an executive session after the voting meeting. That's typically when we have our executive sessions, just because people get to the meetings kind of late. We want to have everybody there for that discussion. And if some sort of decision is made that is actionable at that time, the administration will be directed to, to move forward with uh, posting that information for the public. If no decision is made and some other, you know, further investigation is required, then, you know, the solicitor will continue with that investigation. Okay, that's fair. The only reason I bring it up is because the next board meeting, that puts us about 11 days from the opening season, and they won't have made a chance to get a first oh, right. Mr. Basil, in, in the agenda, is there not a spot in the voting meeting for items that are not on the agenda at the end? 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I mean, so you could bring it up at the end of the voting meeting. You could bring this up at any time you want. You Correct. know, I I whether we have time yeah, but whether we have feedback to give to you is a, is a completely different issue. So our solicitor is working on it. He did send us a letter today. There was some information on it. It wasn't quite conclusive, in, in my opinion. I think we need to talk about it as a board, and we need to talk about it with our solicitor, and then we can make a decision as to what we're going to do. I'm just the concern we have, and that's why there's still girls who fall asleep in the back. Is are four weeks away by the time the meeting's done in two weeks. If nothing's made up with then, you know, then there really there's no movement on it. If they do make a decision in two weeks, then you're, you have 11 days, 10 days to make a decision to find a replacement, another coach, and games aren't scheduled, and it's really a wash. So it's, it's one of these things where the time is now to make a decision. If it's not a decision that made, there's really no reason to have Provided we, you know, who knows what the executive session is going to I mean, we understand the time crunch. So we're going to do our make our best efforts to solve the problem. I, actually, I appreciate the board's time on the matters because it, it's near and dear to a lot of people in this room right now. And no, we understand. Yeah. I just want to say the board isn't dragging its feet. Oh, no, I, know the I, know, I, know, I know the letter came out to the solicitor. Yeah, yeah. it's just such a we have to study it because of its legal nature. Right Some things like that. this are very really cut and dry. <clears throat> we all think everybody here knows that. So. Unfortunately, when the law Thank comes you. into it, there's just so many technicalities. And the second thing I actually want to just talk to is a little bit of this, but I didn't want to come up and take more time with the football comment about 20K. Um, it's my understanding that any budget that's not that's left over goes back in the general fund that's used for other things. Also, so it wasn't wasted. It's, it's not wasted on one sport. It's there. But I also know from being one of the coaches at Blazer Midget Football that every year at the end of the season we have an extra amount of budget that's left over. It's a range of budget. From 4,000 to 10,000, I'm sure the high school is the same thing from probably 10 to 25 for reconditioning of any equipment that doesn't pass inspection. So I, I believe, to go to the point, that money's not just thrown out there just to, to waste. It's there for, in case one year it might be 9,000 reconditioning, one year maybe 19,000. So I think that was what I put in there for that time. So I, I'm going to dovetail on that comment um, as it was represented earlier that um, in conversations with Mr. Legath, I actually. I uh, did have some extensive conversations with him, and, and what you're representing is exactly true and on point. There is some money that needs to be spent, usually not expended until toward the end of the budget year, for all of the reconditioning that is required and necessary if we're going to start talking about health, safety, and welfare as well. We also want to make sure that our young men that put football helmets on are pro properly protected, so and that's an expense that we have to bear. Correct. Still on the sticker, get five regular helmets. And that is not inexpensive. No. It's $195 for the helmet. Thank you. Can I, can I make a real quick comment? Correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, but just because I know you've been sitting here for a while uh, um, looking to, to give us your comments, at the very beginning of the agenda, when we ask for public comments, you can come up then and give us your comments on anything on the agenda. You don't have to wait three hours. Just so you know, because no, I know no, the kids are, I know the kids are going to fall asleep. Back I missed the first ten minutes because that was actually a okay. Well, I mean, I'm not mistaken by saying that. No, no, I said it at the beginning of the meeting. If anybody has any comments on any item in the agenda, you can come forward and talk about it at that time. At the very end of the agenda, you can bring up anything else you want to talk about with the school district. I missed the first ten minutes. So. You know, well, I just don't want you to not come again if you have a concern yeah. you want to bring with you because you think you got to stay here until 10.30 at night. The next meeting we can do this in the first session to find out. Yes. On the agenda. Yes. Yeah, because it's on the agenda. And that will be on the agenda oh, it has to be on the agenda. until it's closed. Okay. Right. In, in the voting meeting? Yeah, I mean, we'll get to the end of the voting meeting. Right. That's You've got yeah. old business, right? Okay. Okay. Royal Reno 367, Douglas Hill. Um, in regards to the softball, could we direct the administration perhaps to have the um, athletic facilitator attempt to set up a schedule for a second team? It would be much easier to cancel games if for some reason you would choose not to allow them a second coach than within five days of the season starting trying to find out what other school districts have a second team that we can play. Um, I just think that that would be an easier route to go that would wouldn't require you to commit tonight that you would be providing a second coach, but it would allow for that possibility. I think it's I a good suggestion. I don't see that there's no cost to us to do that. No. So just why not? It's a good suggestion. Absolutely. We're prepared no matter what we do. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to clarify because I didn't want our topic to get lost in supplies and helmets and different things. Our concern was we have athletes 
is spread out over 3.1 miles. So we have one coach that cannot keep track of everything that's going on with all the different athletes with the coach to student ratio that we have. So everything else is kind of getting convoluted. I want to make sure that our point with cross country is, you know, we have a lot of kids spread out over, again, a 3.1 mile course, which loops most of the time out in the woods in different areas. So the coach cannot see at all times. We have a high student to coach ratio. So as everything else is getting banned around about helmets and supplies, I don't want our concerns. I know you got the letter to get the loss in the shuffle. We're not comparing ourselves. We're just saying these are our unique problems that we have with our sport. This is why we feel we need that second coach to adequately make sure that we can do the things that we want to do and perform at a high level. So please read that letter again. Not, I just don't want our you know, to get complicated with everything else that's going to be around. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other comment? I did have one. Um, in the, right after you asked the question about the students uh, mixing with adults, yeah, I, I just dropped Dr. Lee's a quick email, and he responded about five minutes ago. And it's any of the uh, any anyone has uh, any adult student has to apply and pass a background check as part of their enrollment. Is that the FBI check too? That's, that's the I don't know if it's the FBI check, whatever. Whatever they would, because whatever the background stu- check or <coughs> the school employees need that FBI check also. It's not just the ten dollar child abuse and the PA check. It's the federal FBI check, which is more. If they do the state police check, I believe that includes an FBI check. No, there's three different checks. Yeah, I know, but the state police, when you enroll in their program, it it, it checks all different levels. So. No, I'm going to take that up with Dr. Lee. So, I mean, I think I'll, 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 we'll get the I'll answer to that one. Let's keep moving on. I've been an instructor for eight years. I know what the background checks are and what they require. <laughs> and Mrs. Trainer is agreeing with me. <laughs> okay, let's move on to new business. Okay, the Revenue Enhancement Committee met on February 8th. And what we discussed was um, a lot about the use of school facilities, uh, form number 707G1, and what we were requesting from the board is just kind of come to a consensus that we'd like to be able to charge a facility um, use fee just to submit the form into the school. What's happening is we have a lot of forms that are submitted from many outside um, groups that want to use our facility. Um, there's literal no income that is collected for the use of the facility. The use of the facility directly increased the cost to maintain the facility and it reflects on our uh, Daniel Boone Utilities reports and custodial overtime hours. Um, to uh, process the forms right now, the process is that the, the form is submitted. It goes to the principal. Well, let me just hold on yes. one second. You're talking about an application fee, right? An application fee. So you're, you're suggesting that there be a fee attached with filling out an application to use the facilities. Correct. Okay. So yes. that's that's what you're going with. Okay. Yes. For nonprofits or pro- everybody? Everybody. Everybody who submits this form. So you're going to do it to a nonprofit organization? We have a lot of forms at the moment. I know we do, but the, but the nonprofits pro- use these forms. Just let her finish. Well, the, her finish. well, the facilities right right now, the we're trying to look at how the facility is being used, how the form is being processed. So once this form is submitted to the school, they'll pay a thirty-five dollar fee. Um, right now, the form is being moved from department to department. So it goes to the principal; they have to sign, the athletic director, the business manager, the food service director, and the superintendent all have to sign off on this form and how it's going to be used. That takes a lot of time and manpower to move this form around the building. Um, in years past, looking at the use, the forms that have come through and been submitted to use our facility, um, in 2009, it looks like, well, it was 62 forms. If we were to charge the $35 fee to use the facility, the, to submit the form, we would have made $2,170. If we look at 2009-2010, we put in 100 forms were submitted. That would be $3,500 that we would have gotten. From 2010-2011, there's 120 forms, which was uh, $4,200. And then so far, just this year, this, they've submitted 46 forms, uh, which is $1,610. 
If we would have been collecting a fee that whole time, we would have made $11,480. And this form isn't just like, oh, okay, you just hand that out. It sounds from what the facilities director tells, talks about and other people, it's a lengthy process. This is just the first process of the form is handing it in. Um, a proposed solution was uh, to take the form and actually computerize it and put an online form so that they could actually do everything online and we could get the money um, online also. They could do an online payment with a credit card or however they could process it. Um, you could do it electronically. The collection, unfortunately for the collection that I saw in the past for 2009-2010, we build places that were using our facility, but they, they didn't pay us, according to the collection, the uncollectibles. So what you're finding is we might uh, rent the facility for $12,000, uh, $12, and we're really only getting back $2,000. So you penalize the nonprofits for the It's people not that, nonprofit. I know, but I'm saying you're going to penalize the nonprofits with a $35 application fee because we didn't collect money that was rightfully due ours for the use of that. So I don't think she's talking about it's not the use fee. Money. It's just no, but I'm saying we announced it. I have a question. Why is anybody collecting the money? Why did somebody okay, let, Sorry, let's let her, let her finish, well, why, why? and then we'll go into the other. Well, according to a, a form that I received, it shows that we were billing... It was the facility, not all nonprofit. No, 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 the thing though is, if, if we bill 12 and we only collect three, right. okay, those are profit organizations. Because nonprofits don't get billed. Okay? Uh, well, actually, nonprofits do get billed, depending well, upon the use of the facility. Correct. Our scout correct. troop gets billed at the facility. But if you don't collect the money, then you don't let them use the facility again, or you go after and try to get the money. That's what we're trying to propose in here is an online payment form. If the groups pay online and fill out the form they need to fill out, they can pay online so we know that the $35 is being generated for the form. Then on top of that, if they decide that they're not going to use the facility, see if we automatically, electronically send them a confirmation letter that, yes, your form has been accepted um, and you may use the facility, at that time, we could give them five days to come up after confirmation to pay for the facility. Because what's well, happening? We don't know what the cost of the facilities are. Yes, we do. No, we don't. They're estimates. Really? They're They're estimates. Just, you may not know until the actual custodial time is reported, which could Correct. be a couple weeks Sometimes to a month later. Yeah. Yeah. So this form can float around for a couple weeks before it gets processed. Oh, it could no, the form gets processed right away with estimated costs on there. Okay. The. Um, well, we can write down estimated costs for the facility, but we need to have a sure way of collecting for the use of our facilities. Okay, I have a question. How are all, how are all five of those people going to sign an online form? Well, there's electron. I, I mean, what? I sign online, first thing. So there's an electronic that's, version. That's the first question. The second question is, if you build somebody 12000 they would pay three. Why isn't somebody checking out for I mean, I, Again, Mr. McCullough, just take, if you right? build an online form, we call it a workflow where I work, but okay. it, it's a workflow, okay? I do not believe that the food service director needs to approve the use no, of the I baseball think, field. So I think if you do, and well, again, just give me a second, Mr. Biz. I'm not denying, I'm not, I'm just trying to, if you build the form online and based upon the activity you're doing, you only send it to those specific people because if the food service person is signing this form every single time, no. Okay, so he's not. He's not. He only single. gets it when it has to do with so the So he's not touching. Experience. So all these people aren't touching this form every single time. They're only the people that are relevant are touching this form every time. I, I, I don't have a problem with, with paying a deposit for those that are going to cost. I mean, hell, the scout troop uses it, and we know there's going to be a cost. We know it's going to be at least 300 bucks. Put a $200 deposit on or something. I don't have a problem with that, but to start charging the, the Cub Scouts or the Girl Scouts or Back to Scout well, Night for using the auditoriums and stuff is going, you're going to completely drive them right out of the building. No, they're trying to feed it for the even, application. Right, that's what I mean. If you charge it for you, you're going to drive them all out. Well, there's two different forms that you might be thinking of, because this is just... I filled that form out. Okay, you filled this one yes, out. Yes, You do. have Girl Scouts that fill out that form, PTCs fill out that form, so they would also be charged the $35. They're not filling out an internal building use form, which none of so, us so, so, see. So, so somebody like the PTC will pay us $35 for the form, yet they turn around and donate to the school and help us out with their fundraising. 
Every time they, they used it for one of their meetings, they filled this form. Okay, but, but understand, I think what the issue was, and maybe, I mean, I was at the Revenue Enhancement Committee meeting, so this is what I understood to be. Okay, so there's two things going on. One, we have a paper form that people have to fill out, and it's got to pass through. As, it could be as many as five different hands right. to get approved, right? And, and that means yeah. the secretaries and everybody else have to touch this thing. It gets filed. Somebody wants to go back and say, well, how many forms were filled out this year? Somebody has to physically go to the file, pull them out, and count. 62 or 100 or whatever number of forms is okay so there's an ex there's an ex there's an uh, an abundance of time and the human uh, resources being expended just moving a piece of paper around the district okay the second part of it is is regardless of what organization you are whether you're a nonprofit or for profit or whatever the case may be um, there's a there's a there's a cost to that Right, and so the idea was just like municipalities do. You want to go in and fill out an application to use a municipal uh, recreation field. You pay a fee. You want to go in and get something from municipalities to go use. I don't know what it is they're offering. There, there, there's uh, a room or something like that. A lot of times you have to fill something out and you have to pay a fee. It's a nominal charge to can't handle the processing costs that's incurred by the organization. To, to schedule things oh, and whatnot. Okay, so so that was the purpose of the fee. So right. you're going to charge okay. the music and the sports boosters the $35 application fee. There's yes. another form that if they're using the forms properly that we have on the website, it's another form that's for a use facilities use, but it is for groups that are part of the school. It's the spirit and, um, let me find it, activities and spirit form is what they have. And the form that they should be filling out is the form that indicates school organizations, which that's are fundraising, fundraising and spirit activities. But that's a, that's, that's a, a fundraising form. a fundraising form. It's a facility form. So if this form. is a fundraising form, then this would be separate than this facilities use form. Okay, but we that fundraising start. form may not have any bearing on anybody using a facility. Mm -hmm. Correct. So the point I'm asking, the music boosters and the sports boosters do not have the fundraising form. They use the facility form because they hold their monthly meetings. So you're going to charge them $35 down for that form. When they turn around and that's the whole so purpose of the, those two organizations is to support student stuff. I think the sports boosters meet at Burrowsboro Hall. I don't think they need it. No, they don't. Yeah, Mr. Reed, I, I, got you. I got the point, but, but again, they? I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at Mrs. Penza to try to give me some direction. Oh, okay. Are we Sorry. truly not collecting this money? I don't know about that. To yeah, so I would, I'd be more interested why we're not we're charging yeah, people. Not I would have it. to check into it because my department doesn't do the billing. Okay. I mean, I would rather... Instead of charging $35 for the Boy Scouts Correct. or the Girl Scouts or collect the, the money that's due you. Collect the money due and enforce the money that's due and take a deposit based upon an estimate. You can always refund the money. Take we 70%. put a workflow together. You cut down on a lot of it. It's searchable. It's there. It's easily done. And, and, and again, we keep talking about how we onboard people with a workflow. We don't we use paper in this district. Well, I mean, that's I think we're there's three things that the REC was recommending. Right. So one was... One, charge an application fee to cover the processing costs. Right. Whatever, the, whatever the nominal fee may be, okay? They're making a recommendation of $35. That doesn't pre prevent you from going in and filling out a form and saying, I want to reserve XYZ room every Saturday for the next 12 months. You don't have to fill out a form every month. No. You can fill out one form for an entire year, okay? So that was one thing. So the second part of it was... How do you automate this this process so you're not getting the paper shuffling everywhere? It, it goes with an automatic email blast. If I'm going to run out the middle school for something, then Mr. Hankel gets the notice, the superintendent gets the notice, and somebody, I mean, maybe Ken Smith gets the notice, but you know somebody at the high school doesn't need to get the notice, right? So there's an automated emailing system that's going on that's handling that process. And when it's approved, I get an email back as a customer saying, you've been approved, and now make a payment or deposit to reserve it. Okay, so that was the second piece of it. And the third piece was collection of dues that are uh, owed to the school district and how are we managing that process and making sure we're getting the money that, that is, you know. Is, we got our idea. How hard is it to put the workflow together to work through that process? Uh, the problem right now is we can't do anonymous workflows. So the user public workflow, we're anybody's a public person. Um, we don't know who you are. So to start a workflow based on somebody we don't know who they are okay. is not a feature available to us. Okay. So the other part I was kind of concerned about, you said how many applications this year? 42? So 46. far we have 46 that have been submitted. So we're talking about talking about investing a lot of time in a very small number of pieces of paper. Like it only required two signatures. Yeah, the rest are copied. Has that through the I years? don't know. 
I don't have a problem with your two, your second thing, maybe eventually put online and pay online. I agree with Mr. Shahino. I don't think you should charge $35 for the fee, especially for organizations that are, especially nonprofits. Well, do you think any fee should be charged for processing these forms? Or no? No. I mean, that's, no. that's I mean, let's have that no. conversation no. first. Yeah. No, no. I, I honestly don't. I honestly don't. I mean, if, if, if we have our set, if we have our system set up properly, processing these fees should take second minutes. And they look it up, they check the thing. Again, I, I think that this this took days to get because they had to even grab the information. Well, the, the they problem have to is, go back and the look problem is we don't. And, we're still a paper district. Everything we do is in paper. That's the problem. So, I mean, again, if because it's a paper district and it's the district's fault, we're going to be penalizing a nonprofit Correct. for it. Now, if you want to say, again, I have a problem with $35. If you want to say it's a $5 application fee or maybe a $10, that's a little different. But when you start looking at $35 just to generate a revenue number, that I got an issue with that. If you want to do $5, you want to do kind of help. It costs you $5 to go fill something and bring it to the township hall to use one of their fields or something. But it's not $35. Okay. We got a problem because we're antiquated and everything's paper. Mm -hmm. We onboard people with paper. We carry paper from place to place to place in this district. And because of that, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And money. And money. And I'd like to see more time spent on the people who do get charged a fee. Why we're not? Somebody in this I'd district into a should be following through. And I don't know who that is. I don't know. Wait a minute. In, in terms of the policy, I'm going to make this very clear. When we look at, at, at charging, we go by what's on that policy. That's and, not what I, we have a very liberal policy in terms of not charging a lot of groups. No, that's not what I said, Doctor. I said the ones you do charge, they're not paying. Right. I, I don't. I See, don't. See, that's if I'm right. Is that what you said, Mrs. Hamill? The people at you, they actually charge them. I'm not saying you didn't charge. No, them. Yeah, I'm, I'm not my, aware of that. My sure. point is that the person is actually charged, but then they don't pay. That's so that's that a problem. That is what the information I was given. Well, that's a problem. So someone needs so, to find out who's responsible for collecting those funds. I'm not saying you didn't charge the yeah, right people. No, okay. I'm just saying whoever was charged should have paid. I agree. That's a bigger problem. I'll ask the person that does it tomorrow and find out. I mean, that's a bigger I mean, problem. You collect know. all that money, you had that fifteen hundred dollars for application. You collected nine thousand that somebody else. This is more yeah, important. I still think that's two issues, and I think that I the agree. application fee should be something. And I think they should be processed so, so that when it's done, if it doesn't go electronically now, that it should, it's a fee that should be applied when they submit the form. Something should be there. Hey, can you guys, was there a chalking back there? Thank you. Um, okay, so what's, the, 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 the REC was making a recommendation to implement a fee. We've heard from two board members who are against the fee. Um, how does anybody else feel? Mr. Scott, Mr. Uh, McLaughlin? I have no problem with the $5 fee. Yeah, that's, that's fair. I, I agree. I think $35 is fair. Thank Okay. I think there should be a fee. I just don't know what that should be. Okay, so can there seems to be some kind of consensus that there should be a fee. The next question is, what's the amount? Well, can, I, can I ask, but rather than do this to, because tonight, the, I think you should go back and find out those other questions from the committee and then bring it forward. <laughs> you need to simplify. I think it's more How hard it is to simplify it who the people who are charged aren't paying and why they're not? Then we're well, all that one shot. The process with just getting the submitting the application with a fee, that's what we're asking. And to that's recommend a that's a policy. Change. The dates here from 2009 2010, we changed our stuff. Yes, we did. After this was put in place. That's correct. correct. So right, but there was the no more, proof of that. But no, if you got a more up to date list, because I'm looking here. And, agree, and, and 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 the troops car show is not here, and I know I paid for that. So this list is out of date. We know this was a problem. We put things in place to. Make we revised sure this that policy well, once already. To have that you've got to get the you got to get the ones from the 2010, 2011. Well, somebody's got to have it because I know. Well, so so have it. Okay, so the next there. question is, no, no, who has the, the information at the district mm -hmm. level? To give to the, the district uh, office has it. I will talk to the person responsible for it tomorrow. That's right. There you go. I don't know there what else to tell you. should report yeah. back to the committee. Because remember, Danielle, we put a lot of processes in place right. to make I sure know. we got what you should report I know. back to the committee. I don't have that information. Yeah. I don't do That's it. My department doesn't do it. I will get the information. Well, I guess the, the, the frustration, though, is is Miss Hamill spent a lot of time trying to track down the right party and yeah. hasn't had any luck. Well, but now she can lead it. Well, I have responded with who the right party is, so I will do my best 
in the application. I can only do so the much. Policy <laughs> no, no, I understand. I guess the issue. But we may need to make some internal process yeah, changes in the way we handle that as well. Because I mean, who's the, the person you were talking to? Even word to look forward to for that information that Mr. Sheen was holding up. Same people yeah. on the committee says it really matters. Would you get that for me, Andrew? Andrew. Oh yeah, I mean I forward that to you as as you know that was like an example. But pass, pass, pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but uh, it's still when I asked for that information, they didn't have it. You didn't ask. Well, I asked you. You didn't ask me for what's been paid. Report. You asked me how many forms were filed. Right. But then I asked. It must have been uh, Michelle. Because I wanted to know what the, because I read this off to her, and the... Michelle, what, in my department, doesn't have anything to do no, with that. Uh, Goose. Goose. Oh. Then I, she didn't come to me, so I can't help you. you you got to get the information because <laughs> we examined this as part of your if I don't know about it, I can't. when you first started that committee up. Yeah. We changed the policies and we put in place to make sure we got paid. So I'd like to see what happened after, after that. that. Right. So you're looking at 10 11. You need 2010 2011. That's what I'd like to find out. <laughs> I will do it tomorrow. <laughs> okay. All right. I, yeah. Moving on. I mean, she may not be able to get you the information tomorrow. I will ask her to start compiling it. I think the issue was, that, you know, she was making the she was making the inquiries to what she thought was the right person, but wasn't getting the information. So. Well, I never got the inquiry yeah. to me to the right person to be able to provide the information. Okay. I don't know what you want me to do. Under new business, get to the bottom of it. We're not going to bring them up now. Uh, we got a couple other issues here, right? Okay, I wasn't sure if we kind of. Well, we we did the online application. That was. Um, we're also looking at summer programs, trying to figure out whether that is something we should still pursue um, for the summer. It looks like uh, from the reports that I was looking at, once again, it was reports I found on the on the um, on our information. In 2009, I brought this up already that we had made over $14,000. Uh, 2010, we made 11,000 plus. And then in 2011, we made $4,000. And I was wondering if, if in the program process, because the students did drop, finding out if there was a way to rejuvenate or get the summer programs running and keep the, um, the attendance up. I think Mrs. Trainer could comment on that. Um, as I explained, the two years you quoted the double figures for profits, that was not profit, that was grant subsidized, and so what the, pay, the students paid, which is on an average of about $4,500 a year is the profit. Um, that was just complements of grants that I had that made it look um, out, out of the range. Um, and so uh, we have tried other programs, and it is six of one, half dozen of the other. Half the time we can't get the minimum number of students to sign up, which is 12. Um, and besides that issue, we also have issue with staffing and the cost of staffing, which is tied to your contract. Mm -hmm. And so it, sometimes it's cost prohibitive and therefore um, students don't sign up for the programs. We run quite an array of programs that we have year after year. Um, so. Is there is there something that other school districts are doing that that I don't know what the benchmark is? I mean, are other school districts more successful at summer school programs? Are they more profitable? Are they less so? Are we the, at the top of the heap? I mean, by the way, I have a question. Are we talking about kids that needed to in order to move to the next class? I mean, if we have less kids in the program, I think we're doing something right throughout the rest of the year. Do some academic. <laughs> I think, academic no, but I think the summer right. school program is a whole variety of different no, things. No, most of it's most of it's most of it's. Getting the advanced but that's my great, point right? was the other school besides districts band. offer besides one of the elementary more bands. than what you're required to have right. to get to the next level. We actually run when programs that are sponsored by colleges. Right. In some case, we are some of the only schools in of that? Eastern Pennsylvania that are running some of these programs. Um, so we have some really high quality programs Provided that are sponsored club. through colleges that are running for our students throughout the district. Provided you have 12 students. No. No. That's totally okay. out of our, we don't pay the, okay. the stipends for, we have Camp Invention, we have the Pennsylvania Writing Project out of Westchester University, it's totally a relationship with the colleges. Okay. Um, Do so. we make any money off of that? Do we get any revenue, any use of facility fee, anything no. coming through? We allow them in since it's a courtesy to our students to... They fall under Category academic. 1, where we don't charge. If the you read the policy, that's what it says. <laughs> 
the school buildings are open, so we're not using any facility needs that the staff take care of everything. It's run during the day when custodians are there, and we don't use anything but a classroom. Okay. Something to keep working on, I guess, at REC. All right. Okay. Wait a minute. And then gate receipts. Oh, gate receipts. Our question was, um, we brought up that we have passes that are being sold, the multi-use pass. And once again, I asked for information. They were unaware of how many passes were being um, sold, uh, the multi-pass. The multi-passes are used for 10 home events. A student would pay $30 for that pass, and of which it should be gone after 10 home events. We sold 64 of those at $30, so it's $1,920 that should have been brought in in 2009. Now, I was unable, once again, to get full information after 2009. So, um, uh, there were 142 adults where is this well, information? Right. I mean, well, it, 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 somebody it, asked that. Somebody's got to have there. this data. And if they're not, there's a big issue with yeah. that. Guy. Well, well, that issue. I, this I, is I, the first time it was asked for. So we have can, to have time to get it. Can I just I, take I, I a sent that email. email. Yes, go ahead. It seems like there's something not flowing right. Maybe the request needs to go to Dr. Otto, and then he knows who the request should go out well, to. Well, I sent... Well, do you remember my email I sent? I sent to Dr. Otto, I sent to you, I sent to Andrew. It was all with uh, about 10 or 12 questions on it, and I updated that I needed to have answers. And all the ones These that I could answers. answer, I did, and the yes, other right. ones that needed to come from the athletic office, which they're the ones that sell the well, passes, that's they're the that's ones where that do the things have fallen down. Things are, I'm finding okay. that I'm, so the I'm issue was help. we didn't know how many athletic passes have been sold in the last two years. We don't know if they're being punched properly each time, so people may be still be using passes from 2009 right. and 2012. We don't know how much revenue is being generated by those passes. There's a lot of questions. So um, it looks like in 2009 we made nine thousand twenty dollars in 2009. So what happened in 2010, 2011? Are we still making nine thousand dollars, or are we not? I mean, that's my question. I think they even had a, a ticket program for senior citizens. Yeah, golden passes. Yeah, they have a golden age pass that a senior can get, but they have to follow, they have to fill out the proper paperwork to get that pass. And they have to be local. You and couldn't have them, you couldn't have them for no, out I, I think the problem is bigger. The problem is, is we need to find out where the data is. The data's yeah. got to be here. We just need to ask the right person. Funnel through Dr. Otto, because I can't believe. I'm sure someone in the athletic director's office is either the right. secretary the or well, that's, that's what I'm hoping, but or when or I ask the question ask and I can't answer it or can't find it, then I am the... That's that was the summary of the discussion. That was the summary of the discussion. Some people didn't account for it. But did they say they didn't know or they just didn't answer your email? I know. They answered the emails with some of the questions, and but they programs. were unable to give me all the information that I had put on there. And they still exist, those tickets so they offer. Yeah. No, they still exist. I just don't know if they're being punched. Okay. The suggestion was to when they bring the multi-pass through the gate, they should go to the box office. They should have that multi-pass punched. Remember, it's only 10, 10 home events. And once that 10 event is done, they take the pass and they should throw it away. So and not then as they much as the punch, as much as we collecting the funds for the pass. In addition to no, the pass, that's also an issue. And the pass, if it's the same color it was two years ago, then someone could just go like this with the pass and keep walking. So we just have, I'm just saying, these are ways that maybe some income could be out there or not out there. I don't know unless I see the data. Right, so and I, it should be coming in, but it's not because procedure. Well, we don't know if it's coming it's in or not, not, so that's I, the question. I don't know. It sounds like to me that maybe the athletic facilitator should come to the next revenue enhancement. Exactly. 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 Well, there were some other issues previously but in the meeting. Different. Yes, I thought she was okay, we're all talking about that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, any questions for the REC committee on those issues? All right. Uh, presentations by the public well, on I any... I still have some new business. Okay. Sorry. I'm going to be quick. Two things. Um, one, the calendar on the website mentions that the sports boosters meet at Borough Hall, which if that's not correct, it needs to be changed. And it's Two. not correct. Mr. Okay. Mr. Rathke, Rathke, I'm sorry. Okay. Rebco, you said where? 
A5. Okay, that needs to be updated Sorry. then. If you click on Sports Boosters on the district calendar, it says location, Birdsboro, Borough Hall. That needs to be changed. Uh, that, that doesn't mean that they haven't ever met there. Okay, well, okay then. They have their monthly meetings, but historically, have been A5. Correct. All right. Change, not us. Okay, so I'm confused if they're taking out. Okay, never mind. I'll just move on. We, we're low on time. In our copy of the uh, school leader news that PASBA sends out, it mentions that uh, Pennsylvania is asking for a freeze on adequate yearly, pro uh, adequate yearly progress benchmarks. Do you have any info on this, Dr. Well, it just came out. If you read it, it just came out. January 20th. January, and then it made public after the... Well, it was I, that's, why I didn't bring, that's why I didn't bring it up, because... It just became public when the governor came out with his budget, and so they're still trying to figure out. Well, this was published on January 26th in a newspaper that was last month. Right. But, well, the governor came out with his budget shortly thereafter, so they're trying to figure out what the impact is going to be. I, I track that as part of the legislative. They're tracking it. They haven't determined what the, is going to be required from the individual school districts if they get that freeze approved. Each district is going to have to put together a plan to maintain and improve but they haven't determined what that plan needs to include, and then that's going to be Mrs. Trainer's responsibility to come up with when they decide. The, the loophole that is really the reason PDE is <coughs> meaning to not agree to it, or Pennsylvania, is there's nothing in that legislation that says come 2014. This is different. This is different than the waiver that we were talking about earlier. But this if is they're still looking at annual yearly progress, because it's synonymous with 100% by 2014, um, that it's so convoluted that they really are wary of taking on that challenge of allowing us to take the, the uh, freeze for one year. Yeah, they, they, they had it on PCM where they talked about that. But the thing is, until the U.S. Department of Education comes back and says, we're going to grant you that freeze, and it will not mean that you then come out in two years and you have to go from 65 to 78 or 80 in a one-year increment, until that happens... Until they, they say no, it'll be 62 in two years, and then you start moving again. That's that that, that that's where okay, nothing's I, been. I was come just out looking today, for a little bit more information. Yeah. Yeah. They, they have a that. They All kept right. it down low, even that he did that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for giving me that information. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I will, well, I, yeah, one more thing. Uh, the revival, uh, economic revitalization committee will meet uh, beginning before the voting meeting here at 6:30 on the 27th. It's a public notice, and it will be in the paper. Will public comment be allowed at that meeting? Sure. Okay. Uh, any other new business? Yeah. All right. Uh, presentations by the public. I just wanted to make a comment. Hello, Raina, 367 Buckhead. I am a member of the PTC board, and I have a fundamental problem with being charged with a building usage fee. We gave, Mrs. Sorcia, how many Elmo's rovers did you get last year? Four. Four. PTC uh, paid for at least three of them for AIC. They paid for two for BEC. We wrote, I wrote a check for over $9,000 to the technology department last year. Even if it's a $5 nominal fee, you're charging us to use the buildings to benefit the children of those buildings. And I just can't grasp how that's a good thing in any way, shape, or form. Our budget, everything else has dropped. But we do give back to the elementary level almost $20,000 worth of products and services, minimal, to the to them. And yes, we use the buildings for meetings once a month. We have market day that we use the buildings. But we also do free things for families. We do family fun nights where we invite the community, the children of that school and their parents to come in, and we don't charge them. For you to charge us nominal fee to build out a building you save for, I agree. Why would we want to then support you by buying technology that really the district should be providing, and not the parent teacher council? There you go. Thank you. And I just wanted to put that out there that you might need to think about what kind of impact the decision you make on something like building uses for could make to the community and the volunteers that help support the district. And I'm sure even if they, if they institute a fee, there will still be level one organizations that could be exempted yeah. from it. Correct. Just like we well, did. Well, it didn't really sound like it. Well, I guess, we we, again, it's still got to go yeah, back. Oh, early. absolutely. But this is only step one. I'm glad I didn't leave, but. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Melanie Jones. I live in 64 Marshall Drive. 
Um, this is the first time I'm at a board meeting because I have two small children so I don't have a lot of time. But I'm, I heard a lot about sports and athletics, but when I read in the paper that they're thinking about cutting elementary school teachers and um, how that would affect my kid, my son's going to go to kindergarten and we have come to accept that we're going to have half day kindergarten. I just want to urge the board to really think about the smallest children that are going to go to school and all the issues it's going to create and there's going to be a lot of cuts for them when they go on to middle school and high school. Thank you. I think what he's suggesting is it's something that I think Mr. Sermonero brought up once before too is looking at the idea of some sort of consortium in order to economize and, and save costs. So if you're gonna bring you're gonna bring in a teacher and you get twelve students there, well you know if you can get especially some of the smaller districts like Antietam or Old or something, you know, they may not get twelve to make it economically feasible. To they may want to come here and take the classes here. So we do have um, out of residence fees. We have not been contacted for Yeah, I mean, do we promote that? Did we contact all the other school districts and say, look, this is what we're offering this, this summer, and do you have students that need to take these classes? Or? I give them to my colleagues in the other districts yeah. around the country. Okay. The, the guidance counselors and network with that as well. Yeah. And so they would have to run busing also to bring the students to us. Okay. So. Good point. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, motion to close. Second. Wow. I'm sorry, Scott who said got that? Scott. <laughs> He's got to hit the Scott, <laughs> Scott got to We're done. For the last hour.